good afternoon guys well <laughs> where do I start well I was supposed to have a reading on Wednesday but because on Tuesday I played the game until quite late and there's no excuse Basically, I went, like, unlocked the new raid and everything, so I had a lot of fun on Tuesday night, but I also had a rough time on Tuesday because of personal reasons. Um, if you watch my Tuesday evening stream, you will understand why I was so tired, like, both mentally and physically. Um, anyway. I, I didn't read on Wednesday because of personal reason. Um, also, I couldn't wake up. <laughs> Even though I said it at 11.30am and I still couldn't wake up for it. I woke up at like one thirty. so... Today I woke up a bit... Like around noon. So... And I thought to myself... I should read. <laughs> um... Oh, <laughs> hey, <laughs> my manager is here, bro. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you for coming. I'm just supposed to be waiting, but yeah, um, I was just very, very, very tired on Wednesday. I wanted to do a replacement yesterday, but I just couldn't get out of bed. <laughs> It's been terrible lately. Uh, mental health is tanking, but I'm trying my best. Okay, I'm trying my best. Yeah, sure. It's, it's fine. Go and do your stuff. It's fine. Uh, I've put off the PF PF myself, but I'm gonna. I'm just gonna put it up once. I'm not gonna re redo it because I don't think anyone is. I don't think anyone's here anyway or interested anyway because it's like Friday afternoon and everyone's like working or studying and stuff. But I'm just going to do my reading so that I can put up the video on my YouTube because they're... Hey! Good afternoon, Ando. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Dropping by is fine as well. It's okay. I mean, like I said, I like I always say, there's always bots. So, yeah. Thank you for being here. Um... Uh, well, I checked my YouTube because um, I ported the video over, the vod, the, the part one. Thank you, Anda. Uh, I ported the part one over to YouTube and there's like 12 views within the past few days and I'm like, oh god, people are actually interested in the book and I, sh and I felt like I really should. <laughs> I really should read part two and then on probably probably on monday i'll read part three or or on sunday or anything i don't know we'll see how okay because I, I still don't know if i have time this weekend during the afternoon around this time maybe i'll, I'll read part three as well so that we can uh, finish up the book because it's a really good book anyway without further ado i'm gonna take a sip of my coffee and we are gonna, we are gonna start soon um uh yeah so people are actually interested like there's 12 views for never let me go no six, 15 views now like within the past four days that is a bit insane in my opinion um yes yeah this i think this book is gonna hit the thousands probably like by algorithm one of the my Kazuo Ishiguro reading uh, an artist of the floating world it hits like 4k views 4.1 4.1k views now the part one and then the part two has like 741 45 views I don't understand where all these views come from actually I do it's very weird actually when I look at the analytics right uh, most of my viewers are from Kenya I have a feeling right in Kenya uh, and also the, the, the age, the audience age are like... <laughs> Thank you for the follow, Chizuru. Thank you so much. I'm not sure where you are from. Are you in game? Are you in... 
can find me on Twitch. But thank you so much for being, uh, for for the follow. Thank you so much. <laughs> when I hear that, I just kept thinking. Anyway, thank you so much. I I do reading. Uh, if you are new to my channel, I uh, I play Final Fantasy fourteen a lot, and I rarely lock out. But on certain days or week, oh hey, you're in Tonberry. That's awesome. I'm in Tonberry too. So I don't know how you found me. Uh, oh yeah, you saw you saw my party finder. Okay, that's cool. Probably probably that. Um, I do reading sessions. Uh, as much as I wanted to. <laughs> yeah, it should be like three days a week, but I've been slacking it lately. I haven't been feeling very well. Um, but uh. Uh, reading, reading, reading books on stream is definitely something like a respite for me. So, I mean, respite, or res respite. I think how do you pronounce that word? Um, anyways, um, I feel good when I read books. Uh, but it's just that the motivation to get out of bed is very, very tough lately. Hey! <laughs> oh my God! Oh no! You changed! You have changed! No! <laughs> you have changed! Wow! I love it. I love it. I'll tell you, I love it. You look great. Absolutely great. I think you're trying to look like yourself in real life, right? <laughs> Is this how you look like in real life? I kind of guess it's probably how you look like. <laughs> anyway, uh, people on YouTube are actually interested in the book um, <clears throat> as much as you can. Yeah, I try to, but no, I'm not this tall. I'm like fucking short. I'm like short and stubby. Stubby. <laughs> <laughs> oh god. Anyway, um, I'm short and fat basically. Um, anyway, uh, we should start reading. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you, Chizu. Thank you, Amno. Uh, thank you, Dian. Even though Dian is gonna gonna run away soon, Dian. By the way, that that out the the top is so pretty, right? I love it. I knew it would look good on 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 the Lala fell. I wanna get. I wanna get it too. I, I think I'm probably gonna ask Coco to to craft the chess piece for me. How much is 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 Coco charging for the chess piece? I, I'm still wearing like 630 stuff, so I want to get like higher. Oh! Okay, there are more people coming in. Hey! Oh, oh this is Chizu. Hey! Have a seat, have a seat. Thank you for coming, thank you for coming. Okay, anyway. Um, so we are on part 2 of Never Let Me Go. Okay? Um, uh, it's gonna get. I mean, it's really interesting. Sorry about this kind of guess. 500k. Actually, that's like nothing to me. <laughs> I have so much money. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why I bother. I, I don't know why I'm, I'm like, oh, 500k, that's so expensive. But I have like so fucking much money. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm going to ask Coco to help me craft the chess piece because I'm really like it. It's very pretty. It's very it's very, it's nice on girl character. I don't know how it looks like on guys. Anyways, let, without further ado, that's sweet. Um yeah, like I said, people on YouTube, right, they only care about me reading the book. They don't really care about what I talk about besides the book. Uh so I'm going to read now. Um sorry YouTube people. So, oh my god, yeah, as I was saying, so the, the, the age, the age and gender of the, my audience on YouTube, right, they are like 18 to 24 years old, like 100% 18 to 24 years old, yeah, and then surprisingly there's more male than female, I'm not sure why, and then 64% of them are from Kenya, so I believe that Kenya has artist of the an artist of the floating world by Kazuo Ishiguro as their high school literature or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um 
Okay, by the way, uh, anyway, tell me if my microphone is low or anything, okay? Uh, so that I can do a proper reading without like, you know, without being muffled and everything. Anyway, I should start now. Yeah, I'm just like babbling about my YouTube stuff. Because I'm very proud of it, okay? I have like fucking 4k views on one video. The algorithm is very nice to me, okay? Uh, anyway, let us start reading today. Uh, today we are reading Kazuo Ishiguro's Never Let Me Go, but uh, part 2. Part 2, chapter 10. We are reading chapter 10 through chapter 17. So we have 7 chapters to go. So I'm probably going to finish at 6pm or something. This is going to be a long read, about 4 hours long. Uh, if you guys have to go somewhere, I just, I'm just gonna warn you guys, I'm just warning you guys, this is gonna be a long fucking read. If you guys need to go anywhere to read, to do this new content, just go ahead, don't, 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 don't feel bad or anything. I mean, don't have to feel bad, I mean, you probably don't feel bad, but, anyway, if you need to go to do whatever, just do, it's fine. Um, you can always watch, rewatch the vod that I save. Um, <clears throat> Okay. We're now reading once again. I'm repeating myself once again. We are reading Kazuo Ishiguro's Never Let Me Go, Part 2, Chapter 10. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yep, that definitely suits the environment. Thank you. <laughs> Chapter 10 Sometimes, I'll be driving on a, a long weaving road across marshland Or maybe past rows of furrowed fields The sky big and grey and never changing mile after mile And, I'm, and I find myself thinking about my essay The one I, so, I was supposed to be writing back then when we were at the cottages, the guardians had talked to us about our essays on and off throughout that last summer, trying to help each of us choose a topic that would absorb us properly for anything up to two years. But somehow, maybe we could see something in the guardians' manner. No one really believed the essays were that important, and among ourselves, we hardly discussed the matter. I remember when I went in to tell Miss Emily my chosen topic was Victorian novels. I hadn't really thought about it much, and I could see she knew it. But she just gave me one of her searching stares and said nothing more. Once we got to the cottages though, the essays took on a new importance. In our first days there, and for some of us a lot longer, it was like we were each clinging to our essays. The last task from Hailsham, like it was a farewell gift from the guardians. Over the time, they would fade from our minds but for a while those essays helped keep us afloat in our new surroundings. When I think about my essays today, what I do is go over it in some detail. I may think of a completely new approach I could have taken or about different writers and books I could have focused on. I might be having coffee in a service station, staring at the motorway through the big windows and my essay would pop up in my head for no reason. Then I quite enjoy sitting there, going through it all again. Just lately, I've even toyed with the idea of going back and working on it once I'm not a carer anymore and I've got the time. But in the end, I suppose I'm not really serious about it. It's just a bit of nostalgia to pass the time. I think about these essays the same way I might around this match at Hailsham. I did particularly well in. Or else, an argument from long time ago where I can now think of all the clever things I should have said. It's at that sort of level, daydream stuff. But, as I say, that's not how it was when we first got to the cottages. Eight of us who left Hailsham that summer ended up at the cottages. Others went to the white mansion in the Welsh hills or to the poplar farms in Dorset. In Dorset, 
We didn't know then that all these places had only the most tenuous links with Hailsham. We arrived at the cottages expecting a version of Hailsham for all the students, and I suppose that was the way we continued to see them for a while. We certainly didn't think much of our lives beyond the cottages or about who ran them or how they fitted into the larger world. None of us thought like that in those days. The cottages were the remains of a farm that had gone out of business before. There was an old farmhouse and around it barns, outhouses, stables of all converted for us to live in. There were other buildings, usually the outlying ones, that were virtually falling down which we couldn't use for much, but for which we felt in some vague way responsible, mainly on account of the Kaffirs. He was this grumpy old guy who turned up one or two, three times a week in his muddy van to look the place over. He didn't like to talk to us much, and the way he went around sighing and shaking his head disgustedly implied we weren't doing nearly enough to keep the place up. But it was never clear what more he wanted us to do. He had shown us the list of chores when we first arrived and the students were already there. The veterans, as Hannah calls them, had long since worked out a rota which we kept to which we kept to conscientiously. There really wasn't much else we could do other than report leaking gutters or mop up after the after floods. The old farmhouse the heart of the cottages had a number of fireplaces where we could burn the split log stack in the outer buns. Otherwise, we had to make do with the big boxy heaters. The problem with this was that they worked on gas canisters and unless it was really cold, Kaffirs wouldn't bring many in. We kept asking him to leave a big supply with us but he would shake his head gloomily like we were bound to use them up frivolously or else cause an explosion. So I remember a lot of time outside the summer summer month being chilly. You went around with two or th- even three jumpers on and your jeans felt cold and stiff. We sometimes kept our wellingtons on the whole day, leaving trails of mud and damp through the rooms. Kaffirs, observing this, would sh- again shake his head but when we asked him what else we were supposed to do, the floors being in the state that, that they were, he would make no reply. I'm making it sound pretty bad, but none of us minded the discomforts one bit. It was all part of the excitement of being at the cottages. If we were honest though, particularly near the beginning, most of us would have admitted missing the guardians. A few of us for a time even tried to think of the ca- of Kaffirs as a sort of guardian, but he was having none of it. You went up to greet him when he arrived in his van and he would stare at you like you are you were mad. But this was one thing we had been told over and over, that after Hailsham, there will be no more guardians, so we will have to look after each other. And by and large, I would say Hailsham prepared us well on that score. Most of the students I was close to at Hailsham ended up at the cottages that summer. Cynthia E., the girl who had said about me being with being Ruth's natural successor at that time in the art room, I wouldn't have minded her, but she went to, to Dorset with the rest of her crowd, and the boy, Harry, and Harry the boy I had nearly had sex with, I heard that he went to Wales. But all oh, our gang had stayed together. If we ever missed the others, we could tell ourselves there was nothing stopping us going to visit them. For all our map lessons with Miss Emily, we had no real idea at that point about distances and how easy or hard it was to visit a particular place. We would talk about getting leaves from the veterans when, we are, when they were going on their trips or else how in time we would, learn, we, we would learn to drive ourselves and then we would be able to see them whenever we pleased. Of course, in practice, especially during the first months, we rarely stepped beyond the confines of the cottages. We didn't even walk about surrounding countryside or wander into the nearby village. I don't think we were afraid exactly. We all knew no one would stop us if we wandered off, provided we were back by the end of the day and the time we entered, the, into, we entered into Kaffir's ledger book. That summer we arrived, 
we were constantly seeing veterans packing their bags and rucksacks and going off for two or three days at a time with what seemed to us scary nonchalance. We would watch them with astonishment, wondering if by the following summer we would be doing the same. Of course we were. But in those days, those early days, it didn't seem possible. You have to remember that until that point, we had never been beyond the grounds of Hailsham and we were just bewildered. If you had told me that, that within a year, I had not only developed a habit of taking long solitary walks, but that I had started to learn to drive a car, I would have thought you were mad. Even Ruth looked daunted the sunny day, the minibus, thank you. Even Ruth looked onto the sunny day, the minibus dropped us in front of the farm farmhouse, circled round the little pond and disappeared up the slope. We could see hills in the distance that reminded us of the ones in the distance at Hailsham, but they seemed to us oddly crooked, like when you draw a picture of a friend and it's almost right but not quite, and the face of the sheet gives you the creeps, but at least it was summer, not the way the cottagers would get a few months on with all the puddles frozen over and rough grounds frosted bone hard. The place looked beautiful and cozy, with overgrown grass everywhere, a novelty to us. We stood together in a huddle, the eight of us, and watched Keffers go in and out of the farmhouse, expecting him to address us at any moment. But he didn't, and all we could catch was the odd, irritated mutter about the students who already lived there. Once, as he went to get something from his van, he gave us a moody glance, then returned to the farmhouse and closed the door behind him. Before long though, the veterans, who had been having a bit of fun watching us being pathetic, we were to do much of the same the following summer, came out and took us in hand. In fact, looking back, I see they really went out of their way helping us settle in. Even so, the first, few, the first weeks were strange and we were glad we had each other. We would always move about together and seem to spend large parts of the day awkwardly standing outside the farmhouse, not knowing what else to do. It's funny now recalling the way it was in the beginning because when I think of those days, those years at the cottages, that scared, bewildered start doesn't seem to go with any of the rest of it. If someone mentions the cottages today, I think of the easygoing days drifting in and out of each other's rooms, the languid way the afternoon would fall into evening, then into night. I think of my pile of old paper bags, their pages gone wobbly like they had once belonged to the sea. I think about how I read them, lying on my front on, in the grass on warm afternoons, my hair, which I was growing long then, always falling across my vision. I think about the mornings, waking up in my room at the top of the black barn, to the voices of students outside the field, arguing about poetry or philosophy, or the long winters, the breakfast in the steam-up kitchens, meandering discussions about around the table about Kafka or Picasso. It was always stuff like that at breakfast, never who you had had sex the night before, or why Larry and Helen weren't talking to each other anymore. But then again, when I think about it, there's a sense in which that picture of us, that first day, huddled together in front of the farmhouse, isn't so incongruous after all. Because maybe in a way, we didn't leave it ne behind nearly as much as we might once have thought. Because somewhere underneath, a part of us stayed that way, fearful of the world around us, and no matter how much we despise ourselves for it, unable quite to let each other go. The veterans, who, of course, knew nothing about the history of Tommy and Ruth's relationship, treated them as, long, as a long-established couple, and this seems to please Ruth to no end. For the first weeks after we arrived, she made a big deal of it, always putting her arm around Tommy, sometimes knocking him in the corner of the room while other people were still about. Well, 
this kind of thing might have been fine at Hailsham, but look extremely immature at the cottages. The veterans couple never did anything showy in public, going about in a sensible sort of way like a mother and father might do in a normal family. There was, incidentally, something I noticed about these veteran couples at the cottages, something Ruth, for all her close study of them, failed to spot. And this was how so many of their mannerisms were copied from the television. It first came to me watching this couple, Susie and Greg, probably the oldest students at the cottages and generally thought to be in charge of the place. There was this particular thing Susie did whenever Greg set off on one of his speeches about Proust or whoever. She would smile at the, at the rest of us, roll her eyes and mouth a very empathetically, empathically, <clears throat> mouth very empathically, but only just audibly, God help us. Television at Hilsham had been pretty restricted, and at the cottages too. Though there was nothing to stop us watching all day, no one was very keen on it. But there was an old set in the farmhouse and other in the black barn, and I would watch every now and then. And that's how I realized this God help us stuff came from an American series, one, one of those with an audience laughing along at everything anyone said or did. There was a character, a large woman who lived next door to the main characters who did exactly what Susie did. So when her husband went off on a big spiel and the audience would be waiting for her to roll her eyes and say, God help us. So they would burst into this huge laugh. Once I had spotted this, I began to notice all kinds of other things that the veteran couples had taken from the TV programs. The way they gestured to each other, sat together on sofas, even the way they argued and stormed out of rooms. Anyway, my point is, it wasn't long before Ruth realized the way she has been carrying on with Tommy was all wrong for the cottages and she set about changing how they did things in front of people. And there was, in part, there was in particular this one gesture Ruth picked up from the veterans. Back at Hailsham, when if a couple were parting even for a few minutes, it had been an excuse for, for big embraces or snogging. At the cottages though, when a couple were saying goodbye to each other, there had been hardly any words, never mind embraces or kisses. Instead, you slapped your partner's arm near the elbow, lightly on the back of your knuckle the way you might do to attract someone's attention. Usually, the girl did it to the boy, just as they were moving apart. This custom had faded out by the winter, but when we arrived, it was what was, ex it was, what was going on, and Ruth was soon doing it to Tommy. Mind you, at first, Tommy didn't have a clue what was going on, and would turn abruptly to Ruth and go, What? so that she would have to glare furiously at him like she, eat, like they were in a play and he had forgotten his lines. I suppose she eventually had a word with him because after a week or so, they were managing to do, to do it right, more or less exactly like, ver, like the veteran couples. I had not actually seen the slap on the elbow on the television, but I was pretty sure that's where the idea had come from and just as sure Ruth hasn't, had not realized it. That was why that afternoon I was reading Daniel Deronda on the grass and Ruth was being irritating. I decided it was time someone pointed it out to her. It was nearly autumn and starting to get chilly. The veterans were spending more time indoors and generally going back to whatever routines they had had before the summer. But those of us who had arrived from Hailsham kept sitting outside on those uncut grass, wanting to keep going for as long as possible the routine, the only routine we had got used to. Even so, by that particular afternoon, there were maybe only three or four apart of, from me reading in the field, and since I had gone out of my way to find a quiet corner to myself, I'm pretty sure what happened between me and Ruth wasn't overheard. I was lying on a piece of old tarpaulin, reading, as I say, Daniel Deronda, when Ruth came wandering over and sat down beside me. She studied the, cov the cover of my book and nodded to herself. Then after a minute, just as I knew, she would begin to outline the whole plot of Daniel Deronda. Until that point, 
I had been in a perfectly okay mood and had been pleased to see Ruth, uh, but now I was irritated. She had done this to me a couple times before and I had seen her doing it to others. For one thing, there was the manner she put on, a kind of a nonchalant but sincere one that though she expected people to be really grateful for her assistance, okay, even at that time I was vaguely aware what was behind it. In those early months, we had somehow developed this idea that how well you were settling in in at the cottages, how well you were cope you were settling uh, sorry, how well you were coping was somehow reflected by how many books you have read. It sounds odd, but there you are. It was just something that developed between us and the the ones who had arrived from Hailsham. The whole notion was kept deliberately hazy. In fact, it was pretty reminiscent of the way we have dealt with sex at Hailsham. You could go around implying that you have read all kinds of things, nodding knowingly when someone mentioned, let's say, war and peace, and the understanding that was that no one would scrutinize your claim too rationally. You remember, you have to remember, since we had been in each other's company constantly since arriving at the cottages, it was not possible for any of us to have read War and Peace without the rest of us noticing. But just like with the sex at Hailsham, there was an unspoken agreement to allow for, for a mysterious dimension where we went off and did all this reading. It was, as I say, a little game we all indulge in to some extent. Even so, it was Ruth who took it further than anyone else. She was the one always pretending to have finished anything anyone happened to be reading, and she was the only one with this notion that the, that the way to demonstrate your superior reading was to go around telling people the plots of the novels they were in the middle of. That's why... When she started on Daniel de Ronda, even though I had not been enjoying it, uh, enjoying it much, I closed the book, sat up, and said to her completely out of the blue, Ruth, I've been meaning to ask you, why do you always hit Tommy on the arm like that when you were saying goodbye? You know what I mean. Of course she claimed not to. So I patiently explained what I was talking about. Ruth heard me out and then shrugged. I didn't realize I was doing it. I must have picked it up. I must have just picked it up. A few months before, I might have let it go at that, or probably wouldn't have brought it up in the first place, but that afternoon, I pressed on, explaining to her how it was something from a television series. It's not something worth copying, I told her. It's not what people really do out there, in normal life, if that's what you were thinking. Ruth, I could see, was now angry but unsure how to fight back. She looked away and did another shrug. So what? She said, it's no big deal. A lot of us do it. What you mean is Chrissy and Rodney do it. As soon as I said this, I realized I had made a mistake. Uh, that, That until I had mentioned these two, I had made... I had had Ruth in a corner, but now she was out. It was like when you made a move in a chest and just as you take your finger off the piece, you see the mistake you have made. And there's this panic because you don't know yet the scale of disaster you have left yourself open to. Sure enough, I saw a gleam came through. Sorry, I saw a gleam come into Ruth's eye and when she spoke again, it was in this entirely entirely new voice so that's it that's what's upsetting poor little Kathy Ruth isn't paying enough attention to her Ruth's got big new friends and big and baby sister isn't big getting played with so often stop all that anyway that's not how it works in real families you don't know anything about it oh Kathy the great expert on real families so sorry but that's, ha- but that's what this is, isn't it? You have still got this idea. Us, Hailsham lot, we have to stay together. A tight little bunch must never make any new friends. I've never said that. I'm just talking about Chrissy and Rodney. It looks daft, the way you copy everything they do. But I'm right, aren't I? Ruth went on. 
You are upset because I've managed to move on, make new friends. Some of the veterans hardly remember your name and who can blame them? You never talk to anyone unless they are, they are Hailsham. But you can't expect me to hold your hand at the whole time. We have been here nearly two months now. I didn't take the bait, but, but said instead, Never mind me. Never mind Hailsham. But you keep leaving Tommy in the lurch. I've watched you. I've watched you. You've done it a few times just this week. You left him stranded, looking like some spare part. That's not fair. You and Tommy are supposed to be a couple. That means you look out for him. Quite right, Kathy. We are a couple like you say. And if you must intrude, I'll tell you. We have talked about this, and we have agreed. If he sometimes doesn't feel like doing things with Christy and Rodney, that's his choice. I'm not going to make him do anything he's not yet ready for. But we have agreed. He shouldn't hold me back. Nice of you to be concerned, though. Then she added in quite a different voice. Come to think of it, I suppose you haven't been that slow making friends with at least some of the veterans. She watched me carefully, then did a laugh as though to say, we are still friends, aren't we? But I didn't find anything to laugh about in this last remark of hers. I just picked up my book and walked off without another, another word. That's chapter 10. Oh my God. <sighs> Alrighty. That was fast. One chapter done. Okay. Chapter 11. I should explain why I got so bothered by Ruth saying what she did. Those early months at the cottages had been a strange time in our friendship. Oh ho ho! I don't know if you heard it, but that's the thunder! I'm sorry. It scared me. <gasps> sorry. Okay. Chapter 11. I should start over again. Chapter 11. I should explain why I got so bothered by Ruth saying what she did. Those early months in the cottages had been a strange time in our friendship. We were quarreling over all kinds of little things, but at the same time, we were confiding in, in each other more than ever. In particular, we used to have these talks about the two of us, usually up in my room at the top of the black barn just before going to bed. You could say there were a sort of hangover from those talks in our dorm after light out. Anyway, the thing was, However much we might have fallen out during the day, come bedtime, Ruth and I would still find ourselves sitting side by side on my mattress, sipping on our hot drinks, exchanging our deepest feelings about our new life like nothing had ever come between us. And what made this heart to hearts possible? You might even say that you might even say what made the whole friendship possible during the time was this understanding we had that anything we told each other during these moments would be treated with careful respect. That we would honor confidences and that no matter how much we wrote, we wrote, we, would, we wouldn't use against, against each other anything we had talked about during those sessions. Sorry, the rain is distracting me. Okay. This had never been spelled out exactly, but it was definitely, as I say, an understanding and until the afternoon of the Daniel Deronda business, neither of us had come anywhere near breaching it. That was why when Ruth said what she did about my not being slow making friends with certain veterans, I wasn't just cross. To me, it was betrayal because there wasn't any doubt about what she had meant by it. She was referring to something I had confided in her one night about me and sex. As you had expected, sex was different at the cottages from how it had been at Hailsham. It was a lot more straightforward, more grown up. You didn't go around gossiping and giggling about who had been doing it with whom. You knew, you knew two students had had sex. You didn't immediately start speculating with, about whether they had become a proper couple. 
And if a new couple did emerge one day, you didn't go around talking about it like it's a, it was a big event. You just accepted it quietly and from then on, when you referred to one, you also referred to the other as in Chrissy and Rodney or Ruth and Tommy. When someone wanted sex with you, that too was much more straightforward. A boy would come up and ask if you want to spend the night in his room for a change, something like that. It was no big deal. Sometimes it was because he was interested in becoming a couple with you. Other times, it was just for a one-nighter. The atmosphere, like I say, was much more grown up. But when I look back, the sex at the cottages seems a bit functional. Maybe it was precisely because of all the gossip and secrecy had gone. Or maybe it was because of the cold. When I remember sex at the cottages, I think about doing it in the freezing rooms in the pitch dark, usually under a ton of blankets. And the blankets were often weren't even blankets, but a really odd assortment of old curtains, even bits of carpets. Sometimes it gets it got so cold you just had to pile anything you could over you, and if you were having sex at the, at the bottom of it, it felt like a mountain of bedding was pounding at you. So half of the time, you weren't sure if you were doing it with the boy or all that stuff. Anyway, the point is, I had had a few one-nighters shortly after getting to the cottages. I had not planned it that way. My plan had been to take my time, maybe become part of the couple become a part of a couple with someone I chose carefully. I had never been in a couple before, and especially after watching Ruth and Tommy for a while, I was quite curious to give it a try for myself. As I say, that had been my plan, and when one-nighters kept happening, it unsettled me a little bit. That was why I had decided to confide in Ruth that night. It was, ma- it was in many ways a typical evening session for us. We had brought up our mugs of tea, and we were sitting in my room, side by side on the mattress, our heads slightly stooped because of the rafters. We talk about the different boys at the cottages and whether any of them might be right for me. And Ruth had been at her best, encouraging, funny, tactful, and wise. That's why I decided to tell her about the one-nighters. I told her how they had happened without my really wanting them to. And how even though we couldn't have babies from doing it, the sex had done funny things to my feelings and just as Miss Emily had warned. Then I said to her, Ruth, I wanted to ask you, do you ever get so you just really have to do it with anybody, almost? Ruth shrugged and then said, I'm in a couple, so if I want to do it, I'll just do it with Tommy. I suppose so. Maybe it's just me anyway. There might be something not quite right with me down there because sometimes I really, really need to do it. That strange Cathy, she fixed me with a concerned look, look, which made me feel all the more worried. So you don't ever get like that? She shrugged again. Not as I would do it with just anybody. What you are saying does sound a bit weird, Cathy, but maybe it will calm down after a while. Sometimes it won't be there for ages, but then it suddenly comes on. It was like that the first time it happened. He had started snogging me and I just wanted him to get off. Then suddenly it just came on out of nowhere. I just really had to do it. Ruth shook her head. It does sound a bit weird, but it will probably go away. It probably just to do with the different food we eat here. She hadn't been a huge help, but... She had been sympathetic, and I felt a little bit better about it after afterwards. That's why it was just, it was such a jolt to have Ruth suddenly bringing it up the way she did in the middle of the argument we were having that afternoon in the field. Okay, there was probably no one to overhear us, but even so, there was something not odd at all right about what she had done. In those first months at the cottages, our friendship had stayed intact because, on my side at least, I had this notion that there were two quite separate roofs. There was one roof who was trying to impress the veterans, who wouldn't hesitate to ignore me, Tommy, or any of the others if she thought that we would cramp her style. This was the roof that I wasn't pleased with. 
the the one I could see every day putting on airs and pretending, the Ruth who did the slap on the elbow gesture. But the Ruth who sat beside me in the in my little attic room that days close, legs outstretched over the edge of my mattress, her steaming mug held in both her hands. That was the roof from Hailsham. And whatever had been happening during the day, I could just pick up with her where she, we had left off the last time we sat together like that. And until that afternoon in the field, there had been a definite understanding that these two roofs wouldn't merge. That the one I confided in before bed was the one I could absolutely trust. That's why when she said that about my not being slow making friends with at least some of the veterans, I got so upset. That's why I just picked up my book and walked off. But when I think about it now, I can see things more from Ruth's, point, Ruth's viewpoint. I can see, for instance, how, how she might have felt if I had been the one to first violate an understanding that her little dig had just been a retaliation. This never occurred to me at that time, but I see it now. It's a possibility and an explanation for what happened. After all, immediately before she made the remark, I have been talking about the arm slapping business. Now, it's a bit hard to explain this, but some sort of understanding had definitely developed between the two of us about the way Ruth behaved in front of the veterans. Okay? She often laughed and implied all sorts of things I knew weren't true. Sometimes, as I said, she did things to impress the veterans at our expense. But it seemed to me Ruth believed at some level that she was doing all this on behalf of us all. And my role as her closest friend was to give her silent support as if I was in the front row of the audience when she was performing on the stage. She was struggling to become someone else and maybe felt the pressure more than the rest of us because I, as I say, she had somehow taken on the responsibility for all of us. In that case then, the way I had th talked about her slap on the elbow thing could be seen as a betrayal and she might well then just felt justified retaliating as she had. As I say, this explanation only occurred to me recently. At the time I didn't look at the larger picture or at my or at my own part in it. I suppose in general I never appreciated in those days the sheer effort Ruth was making to move on, to grow up and leave Hailsham behind. Thinking about this now I am reminded of something she told me once when I was caring for her in the in at in the recovery center at Dover. We had been sitting in her room watching the sunset, as we so often did, enjoying the mineral water and biscuits that I had brought, and I had been telling her about how I still had most of my old Hailsham collection box safely stowed inside my pine chest in my bed seat. Then, I wasn't trying to lead onto anything or make any kind of point I just happened to say to her. You never had a collection after Hailsham, did you? Ruth, who was sitting up in the bed, was quiet for a long time, the sunset falling over the tiled wall behind her. Then she said, Remember the guardians? Before we left? How we, they kept reminding us to take our collections with us? So I had taken everything out of my box and put it into these hold-all bags. My plan was that I, I would find a really good box for it all once I got to the cottages but when we got there I could see none of the veterans had collections it was only us it wasn't normal we must have all realized it I wasn't the only one but we didn't really talk about it did we so I didn't go looking for a new box my things all stayed in the whole all bags for months then in the end I threw them away I stared at her you put your collection out with the rubbish? Ruth shook her head, and for the next few moments seemed to be going through in her mind all the different items in her collection. Finally, she said, I put them all in a bean bag, but I couldn't stand the idea of putting them out with the rubbish. So I asked old Kaffers once when she was about to drive off if she would take the bean bag to a shop. I knew about charity shops. I had found it all out. Kaffer's rummage in the back bit. She didn't know what any of it was. Why should he? 
and he did this laugh and said no shop he knew would want stuff like that. And I said, it's good stuff, really good stuff. And he could see I was getting a bit emotional. And he changed his tune then. He said something like, alright, Missy, I'll take it along to the Oxfam people. Then he made a real effort and said, now I've had a closer look. You're right, it is pretty good stuff. He wasn't very convincing though. I suppose he just took it that way and put it in some bin somewhere. But at least I didn't have to know that. Then she smiled and, and said, You were different, I remember. You were never embarrassed about your collection and you kept it. I wish now I had done that too. What I'm saying is that we were all of us struggling to adjust to our new life. And I suppose we all did things back then we later regretted. I was really upset with Ruth's remarks at the time, but it's pointless now trying to judge her or anything else for the way they behaved during those early days at the cottages. As the autumn came on and I got more familiar with our surroundings, I began noticing things that I had missed earlier. There was, for instance, the odd attitude to students who had recently left. The veterans were never slow coming out with funny anecdotes about the characters they had met on trips to the white mansion on the poplar farms, but they hardly ever mentioned students who, right up until just before we had arrived, must have been in their intimate friends. One moment, please. Another thing I noticed see it tied in was the big hush that would dis dis descend around descend around certain veterans. <laughs> Thank you for the follow, Elufusia. Thank you. Another thing I, that I noticed and I could see it tied in was the big hush that would descend around certain veterans when they went off their courses, which even we knew had to do with becoming carers. <clears throat> they could be gone for out for four out sorry, they could be gone for four or five days, but were hardly mentioned in that time and when they came back, no one really asked them anything. I suppose they might have talked to their closest friends in private, but there was definitely an understanding that you didn't mention these trips out in the open. I can remember one morning watching through the misted up windows of our kitchen, two veterans leaving for a course and wondering if by the next spring or summer they, ha they would have gone all together and would be taking care not to mention them. But it's perhaps stretching it to, a, to claim students who had left were an actual taboo. If they had to be mentioned, they got mentioned. Most commonly, you would hear them referred to indirectly in connection with an object or a chore. For example, if repairs were needed to a downpipe, there would be a lot of discussion about the way Mike used to do it. And there was a tree stump outside the black barn, everyone called Dave Stumped, because for over three years until a few weeks before our arrival, he would sit on it to read and write, sometimes even when it was raining and raining or cold. Then, maybe most memorably, there was Steve. None of us ever discovered anything much about the sort of person Steve had been, except he had liked porn magazines. Every now and then you would come across a porn magazine at the cottages, thrown behind a sofa or amidst a pile of old newspapers. They were what you would call soft porn, though we didn't know what about we didn't know about such distinctions then. We would never come across anything like that before and didn't know what to think. The veterans usually laugh when one show up and flick through it quickly in a blasé way before throwing it aside. We, so we did the same. When Ruth and I were remembering all this a few years ago, she claimed that there were dozens of these magazines circulating around the cottages. No one admitted to liking them, she said. But you remember how it was. If one turned up in one... in, Sorry, if one turned up in a room... Everyone pretended to find it dead boring. Then you, you came back half an hour later, it would have always be gone. Anyway, 
My point is that whenever one of these magazines turned up, people would claim that it was left over from Steve's collection. Steve, in the other words, was responsible for every porn magazine that ever showed up. As I say, we never found out much else about Steve. We did, though, see the funny side of it even then. So that we never pointed and said, Oh look, one of Steve's magazine. They did it with a, a bit of irony. These magazines, incidentally, used to drive old Kefir's mad. There was a rumor that he was religious and dead against not just porn but sex in general. Sometimes he had worked himself into a complete state. You could see his face under his grey whiskers and blotchy with his grey whiskers blotchy with fury and he would go thudding around the place barging into people's room without knocking determined to round out every one of Steve's magazine. We did our best to find him amusing on these occasions, but there was something truly scary about him in those moods. For one thing, the grumbling he usually kept up suddenly stopped and the silence alone gave him an alarming aura. I remember one particular time when Kefirs had collected up six or seven of Steve's mags and stormed out with them to his van. Laura and I were watching him from up in my room and I had been laughing at something Laura had just said. Then I saw Kefirs opening his van door and maybe because he needed both hands to move some stuff about, he put the magazines down on top of some brick stack outside the boiler hut. Some veterans had tried to build a barbecue there a few months earlier. Kefir's figure, bent forward, his head and shoulders hidden in the van, went on rummaging for about ages, and something told me that for all his fury of the, a moment ago, he had now forgotten about the magazines. Sure enough, a few minutes later, I saw him straighten, climb in behind the wheel, and slam the door, drive off. When I pointed out to Laura that Kefir's had left the magazines behind, she said, well, they won't stay for they won't stay put for long. He will just have to collect them all ag again, collect them all up again next time he decides on a perch. But when I found myself strolling past the broiler hut about half an hour later, I saw the magazines hadn't been touched. I thought for a moment about taking them up to my room, but then I could see if they were ever found there, I would get no end of teasing and how there was no way people would understand my reasons for doing such a thing. That was why I picked up the magazines and went inside the boiler hut with them. The boiler hut was really just another barn bought, built onto the end of the farmhouse filled with the old, move, old mowers and pitchforks, stuff Kefirs reckoned wouldn't catch a light too easily if one day the boiler decided to blow up. Kefirs also kept a workbench there, so I put the magazines down on it, pushed aside some old rags, and heaved myself up to sit on, t on the tabletop. The light wasn't too good, but there was a grimy window somewhere behind me, and when I opened the first magazine, I could find myself see well enough. There were lots of pictures of girls holding their legs open or sticking their bottoms out, I'll admit. There have been times when I looked at pictures like that and felt excited. Though I've never fancied doing it with a girl, but that's just not, but that's not what I was after. Th after that afternoon, I moved through the pages quickly, not wanting to be distracted by any buzz of sex coming off those pages. In fact, I hardly saw the contorted bodies because I was focusing on the faces. Even in the little adverts for vi videos or whatever tucked away to the side, I checked each model's face before moving on. It, was, it wasn't until I was nearing the end of the pile that I became certain that there was somebody standing outside the barn just beside the doorway. I had left the door open because that's how it was normally, and because I wanted the light, and twice already I had found myself glancing up, thinking I had heard some small, small noise, but there had been no one there, and I had just gone on with what I was doing. Now. I was certain though, and lowering, and lowering my magazine, I made a, heaving, a heavy sighing sound that would be clearly audible. I waited for giggling or maybe two or three students to come bursting into the barn, eager to make the best of having caught me with a pile of porn magazines, but nothing happened. So I called out in what I tried to make a wary tone. Delighted you could join me. Why be so shy? There was a little chuckle, then Tommy appeared, 
at the threshold. Hi, Cass, he said sheepishly. Come in, Tommy. Join in the fun. He came towards me cautiously, then stopped a few steps away. Then he looked over at the boiler and said, I didn't know you liked that sort of stuff. Girls are allowed too, aren't we? I kept going through the pages, and for the next few seconds, he stayed silent. Then I heard him say, I wasn't trying to spy on you, but I saw you from my room. I saw you come out here and pick up the pal Kaffers left. You're very welcome to them when I'm when I finished. He laughed awkwardly. It's just sex stuff. I expect that I've seen them all already. He did another laugh, but then when I glanced up, I saw he was watching me with a serious expression. Then he asked, Are you looking for something, Kath? What do you mean? I'm just looking at dirty pictures. Just for kicks? I suppose you could say so. I put down one of the magazines and started on the next one. Then I heard Tommy's step coming nearer and he was right up to me. When I looked up again, his hands were hovering fretfully in the air, like I was doing a complicated manual task and he was itching to help. Kath, y y you don't... Well, if it's for the kicks, you don't do it like that. You've got to look at the pictures much more carefully. It doesn't really work if you go that fast. How do you know what works for girls? Or maybe you have looked this over with Ruth. Sorry, not thinking. Cass, what are you looking for? I ignored him. I was nearly at the end of the pile, and I was now keen to finish. Then he said, I saw you doing this once before. This time, I did stop and look at him. What's going on here, Tommy? Has Kaffers recruited you for his porn patrol? I wasn't trying to spy on you, but I did see you at that time last week, after we had all been up in Charlie's room. There was one of these magazines there, and you thought we had left all and gone, but I came back to get my jumper and Claire's drawers. doors were open so I could see straight through Charlie's room. That's how I saw you in there, going through the magazine. Well, so what? We all have to get our kick some way. You weren't doing it for kicks. I could tell. Just like I can tell right now, it's your face, Kath. That time in Charlie's room, you had a strange face. Like you were sad, maybe, and a bit scared. I jumped off the workbench, gathered up the magazines, and dumped them in his arms. Here, give this to Ruth. See if they do anything for her. I walked past him and out of the barn. I knew he would be disappointed I hadn't told him anything, but at that point, I hadn't thought things through properly myself and wasn't ready to tell anyone. But I hadn't minded him coming into the boiler hut after me. I hadn't minded at all. I felt comforted, protected almost. I did tell him eventually, but that wasn't until a few months later when we went on our Norfolk trip. Chapter 12 One second Am I going too fast? Shall I read slower? God I should read slower I read too fast That's why I jumble out my letters together Jumble out the words together, sorry Anyway, thank you so much Alicia, for the follow Thank you so much, thank you so much Chapter 12 I want to talk about the Norfolk trip and all the things that happened that day but I'll first have to go back a little bit to give you the background and explain why it was we went. Our first winter was just about over by then and we were all feeling much settled, much more settled. For all our little hiccups, Ruth and I kept up our habit of rounding off the day in my room talking over our hot drinks and it was during one of those sessions when we were larking around about something that she suddenly said. I suppose you have heard what Christine Rodney had been saying. When I said I had not, she did, she did a laugh and continued. They are probably just having me on the idea of a joke. Forget I mentioned it. But I could see she wanted me to drag it out of her, so I kept pressing until in the end, she said in lowered voice. You remember last week? When uh, Chrissy and Rodney were away, they had been up to this town called Cromer, up on the north of Norfolk coast. What were they doing there? 
Oh, I think they got a friend there. Someone who used to live here. That's not the point. The, the point is they claim they saw this... This person working there in this open plan office. And well, you know, th they reckon this person's a possible for me. Though most of us had first come across the idea of possibles back at Hailsham, we had sense we weren't supposed to discuss it, and so we had not, though for sure it had both intrigued and disturbed us. And even at the cottages, it wasn't a topic you could bring up casually. There was definitely m more awkwardness around any talk of possibles than there was, say, sex. At the same time, you could tell people were fascinated, obsessed in some cases, and so it kept coming up, usually in solemn arguments, a world away from our ones, say James Joyce. The basic idea behind the possible theory was simple, and didn't provoke much dispute. It went on, some, it went on like this. Since each of us was copied at some point from a normal person, there must be for each of us Somewhere out there, a model getting on with his or her life. This meant, at least in theory, you'd be able to find the person you were modeled from. That's why, when you were out there, yourself, in towns, shopping centers, transport cafes, you kept an, out, an eye out for possibles. The people you might have been, mod been the models for you and your friends. Beyond these basics though, there wasn't much consen consensus. For a start, no one could agree what we were looking for when we looked for possibles. Some students thought you should be looking for a person 20 or 30 years older than yourself, the sort of age a normal parent would be. But others claimed that this was sentimental. Why would there be a natural generation between us and our models? They could have been used babies, old people, what difference would it have made? Others argued back and that, that they had used for models people at the peak of their health and that's why they were likely to be normal parent age. But around here, we had all sense that we were near territory we didn't want to enter and the arguments would fizzle out. Then there was those questions about why we wanted to track down our models at all. One big idea behind finding your model was that when you did, you would glimpse your future. Now, I don't mean anyone really thought that if your model turned out to be, let's say, a guy working at a railway station, that's what you're going to end up doing too. We all realized it wasn't that simple. Nevertheless, we, all of us, to varying degrees, believed that when you saw the person you were copied from, you would get some insight into who you were deep down and maybe too, you would see something of what your life held in store. There were some who thought it stupid to be concerned about possibles at all. Our models were irrelevant, a technical necessity to, for bringing us into the world, nothing more than that. It was up to each of us to make our lives what we could. This was the camp roof always claimed to sight with, and I probably did too. All the same, whenever we heard reports of possibles, whoever it was, we couldn't help getting curious. The way I remember it, sightings of possibles tended to become tended to come in batches. Weeks could go by with no one mentioning the subject, then one reporting sighting would trigger off a whole spate of others. Most of them were obviously not worth pursuing someone seen in a car going by, stuff like that. But every now and then, a sighting seemed to have some substance to it, like the one Ruth told me about that night. According to Ruth, Chrissy and Rodney had been busy exploring the sea this seaside town they had gone to and had split up, split up for, for a while. When they met up again, Rodney was all excited and had told Chrissy how he had been wandering the, sea the side streets of the high street and had gone past an office with a large glass front. Inside had been a lot of people, some of them at their desk, some walking about and chatting, and that's where he had spotted Ruth's possible. Chrissy came and told me as soon as they got back, 
she she made Rodney describe everything, and he did his best. And it was pot it was impossible to tell anything. Now they kept talking about driving me up there, but I don't know. I don't know if I ought to do anything about it. I can't remember exactly what I said to her that night, but I was at that point pretty skeptical. In fact, to be honest, my guess was that Chrissy and Rodney had made the whole thing up. I don't want to suggest Chrissy and Rodney are bad people, but that that would be unfair. In in many ways, I actually like them. But the fact was, the way they regarded us newcomers and Ruth in particular was far from straightforward. Chrissy was a tall girl who was quite beautiful when she stood up to her full height, but she didn't seem to realize this and spend her time crou crouching to be the same as the rest of us. That's why she often looked more like Wicked Witch than a movie star, an impression reinforced by her irritating way of jabbing you with a finger the second before she said something to you. She always wore long skirts rather than jeans, and little glasses pressed too far into her face. She had been one of the veterans who had really welcomed us when we first arrived in the summer, and I had been, at first, really keen, really taken by her, sorry, really taken by her and looked to her for guidance. But as the weeks passed, I, I had begun to have reservations. There was something odd about the way she was always mentioning the fact that we had all come from Hailsham, like that could explain almost anything to do with us. And she, would, and she was always asking us questions about Hailsham, about little details, much like my donors now, donors do now. And although she tried to make out this were re although she tried to make out this were very casual, I could see there was a whole other dimension to her interest. Another thing that got to me was the way she always seemed want to separate us, talking, talking to one of. Taking one of us aside when a few of us were doing something together or else inviting two of us to join in something while leaving another two stranded, that sort of thing. You would hardly ever see Chrissy without her boyfriend, Rodney. He went around with his hair tied back in a ponytail like a rock musician from the 70s and talked a lot about things like reincarnation. I actually got to quite like him but he was pretty much under Chrissy's influence. In any discussion, you knew he would back up Chrissy's angle, and if Chrissy ever said anything mildly amusing, he would be sh chuckling and shaking his head like he couldn't believe how funny it was. Okay, I may be being a bit hard on these two. When I was remembering them with Tommy not so long ago, he thought they were pretty decent people, but. I'm telling you all this now to explain why I was so skeptical about the reported sighting of Ruth possible. As I was saying, my first instinct was not to believe it and to suppose Chrissy was up to something. The other thing that made me doubtful was all this had to do with the actual description given by Chrissy and Rodney. The picture of a woman working in a nice glass front office. To me, at the time, this seemed just too close a match to what we then knew to be Ruth's dream future. I suppose it was mainly us newcomers who talked about dream futures that winter, though a number of veterans did too. Some older ones, especially those who started their training, would sigh quietly and leave the room when this sort of talk happened. But for a long time, we didn't even notice this happening. I'm not sure what was going on in our heads during this discussion. We probably knew they couldn't be serious, but then again, I'm sure we didn't regard them as fantasy either. Maybe once Hailsham was behind us, it was possible just for that half a year or so, before all the talk of becoming carers, before driving lessons, all those other things, it was possible to forget for the whole stretches of time who we really were. To forget what the guardians had told us, to forget what Miss Lucy's outburst that rainy afternoon at the pavilion, as well as all those theories we had developed among ourselves over the years. It couldn't last, of course, but like I said, just for those few months, we somehow managed to live in this cozy state of suspension in which we could ponder our lives without the usual boundaries. Looking back now, 
It feels like we spent ages in that steam up kitchen after breakfast or huddled around the half dead fires in the small hours lost in conversation about our plans for the future. Mind you, none of us push it too far. I don't remember anyone saying they were going to be movie star or anything like that. The talk was more likely to be coming a postman or working for a farm. Quite a few students wanted to be drivers of, of one sort or another. And often, when the conversation went this way, some veterans would begin comparing particular scenic routes they had traveled, their favorite roadside cafes, difficult roundabouts, that sort of thing. Today, of course, I'll be able to talk about a lot of them under the table on those topics. Back then, though, I used to just listen, not saying a thing, drinking in their talk. Sometimes, if it was late, I would close my eyes and nestle against the arm of a sofa or of a boy if it was during one of those brief phases I was officially with someone and drift in and out of sleep, letting images of roads move through my head. Anyway, back to my point. When this sort of talk was going on, it was often Ruth who took it further than anybody, especially when there were veterans around. She had been talking about offices right from the start of the winter. But when it really took on life, when it became her dream future, was after that morning she and I walked into the village. It was during a bitterly cold spell and our boxy gas heaters had been giving us trouble. We had spent ages trying to get them to light, clicking away with no result, and we had to give up on more and more and along with them the rooms they were supposed to heat kaffirs refused to deal with it claiming it was our responsibility but in the end when things were getting really cold he had handed us an envelope with money and a note of some igniter fuel that we could buy so groove and i had volunteered to walk to the village to get it and that's why we were going down the lane that frosty morning we had reached a spot where the hedges were high on both sides and the ground was covered in frozen cow pads. when Ruth suddenly stopped a few steps behind me. It took me a moment to realize so that by the time I turned around back, uh, turned back to her, she was breathing over her fingers and looking down and gross, engrossed by something beside her feet. I thought maybe it was some poor creature dead in the, in the, in the frost but when I came up, I saw it was a color magazine. Not one of Steve's magazines, but one of those bright, cheerful things that comes free with newspapers. It had fallen open in the glossy double page advert, and though the paper had gone soggy and there was mud on one corner, you could see it well enough. It showed this beautifully modern open plan office with three or four people who work in it having some kind of a joke with each other. The place looked sparkling and so did the people. Ruth was staring at this picture and when she noticed me beside her said, Now, that would be a proper place to work. Then she got self-conscious, maybe even cross that I had caught her like that and set off again much faster than before. But a few evenings later, when several of us were sitting around a fire in the farmhouse, Ruth began telling us about the sort of office that she, she would ideally work in. And I immediately recognized it. She went into the details, the plants, the gleaming equipments, equipments, the chairs with the swivel and casters. And it was so vivid, everyone let her talk uninterrupted for ages. I was watching her closely. But it, was, it never seemed to occur to her that I might make the connection. Maybe she had even forgotten herself where the image had come from. She even talked at one point about how the people in her office would be dynamic, go-ahead types. And I remembered clearly those, this, those same words written in big letters across the top of the advert. Are you the dynamic, go-ahead type? Quote, something like that. Of course, I didn't say anything. In fact... Listening to her, I even started wondering if maybe it was all feasible. If one day, we might all of us move into a place like that and carry on with our lives together. Christy and Rodney were there that night, of course, hanging on to every word. And then for days after that, Christy kept trying to get Ruth to talk some more about it. I would pass them sitting together in one corner of the room and Christy would be asking, 
Are you sure you wouldn't put each other off working all together in a place like that just to get Ruth going at on on it again? The point about Chrissy, and this applied to a lot of the veterans, was that for all her slightly patronizing manner towards us when we first arrived, she was awestruck about our being from Hailsham. It took me a long time to realize this. Take the business about Ruth's office, Chrissy would never herself have talked about working in any office, never mind one like that. But because Ruth but because Ruth was from Hailsham, somehow the whole notion came within the realms of the possible. Th that's how Chrissy saw it. And I suppose Ruth did say a few things every now and then to encourage the idea. Sure enough, in some mysterious way, a separate set of rules applied to us Hailsham students. I never heard Ruth actually lie to veterans. It was more to do with not denying certain things, implying others. There were occasions when I could have brought the whole thing down over her head, but if Ruth was sometimes embarrassed, catching my eyes in the middle of a sto some story or other, she seemed confident I wouldn't give her away, and of course, I didn't. So that was the background to Chrissy and Rodney's claim to have seen Ruth possible. And you can maybe see now why I was wary about it. I wasn't keen on Ruth going with them to Norfolk. Though, I couldn't really say why. And once it became clear she was completely sent, set on going, I told her that I would come too. At first she didn't seem too delighted. And there was even a hint that she wouldn't, she wouldn't let Tommy come with her. In the end, though, we all went, the five of us. Chrissy, Rodney, Ruth, Tommy, and me. That was the end of chapter 12. Hey, hey. Hey, I'm feeling I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll go once more. Sorry I didn't read on Wednesday. Chapter 13 Rodney, who had a driver's license, had made, an had made an arrangement to borrow a car for the day from the farm workers at Matchley a couple of miles down the road. He had regularly got, the got cars this way in the past, but this particular time, the arrangement broke down the day before we were due to set off, though things got sorted out fairly easily. Rodney walked over to the farm and got a promise on another car. The interesting thing was the, roof, the way Ruth responded during those few hours when it looked like the trip might have to be called off. Until then, she, w she had been making out the whole thing was a bit of a joke. That if anything she was going along with, it is to please Chrissy. And she had talked about a lot about how we weren't exploring our freedom nearly enough since leaving Hailsham. How anyway, she had always wanted to go to Norfolk to find all our lost things. In other words, she had gone out of her way to let us know that she wasn't very serious about the prospect of finding her possible. That day, before we went, I remember Ruth and I had been out for a stroll. And we came into the farmhouse kitchen where Fiona and a few veterans were making a huge stew. And it was Fiona herself, not looking up from what she was doing, who told us how the farm boy had come earlier, come in earlier with a message. Ruth was standing just in front of me, so I couldn't stay, see her face, but her whole posture froze up. Then, without a word, she turned and pushed past me out of the cottage. I got a glimpse of her face then. That's when I realized how upset she was. Fiona started to say something like, Oh, I didn't know. But I quickly said, That's not what Ruth's upset about. It's about something else. Something that had happened earlier. It wasn't very good, but it was the best thing I could do on the spur of the moment. In the end, as I said, the vehicle crisis got resolved and early the next morning, in the pitch dark, the five of us got inside the bash up but perfectly decent rover car. The way we sat was with Chrissy up front next to Rodney and the three of us at the back. That was what had felt natural and we had got in like that without thinking about it. But after only a few minutes, once Rodney had brought us out of the dark winding lanes onto the proper roads, Ruth, who was in the middle, leaned forward, put her hands on in, 
put her hands on the front seats and began talking to the two veterans. She did this in a way that meant Tommy and I, on either side of her, couldn't hear anything they were saying, and because she was between us, couldn't talk to or even see each other. Sometimes, on the rare occasions when she did lean back, I tried to get something going between the three of us, but Ruth wouldn't pick up on it, and before long she, she, was, she would be crouched forward again, her face stuck between the two front seats. After an after about an hour, with days starting to break, we stopped to stretch our legs and let Rodney go for a pee. We had, pulled a, we had pulled over beside a big empty field, so we jumped over the ditch and spent a few minutes rubbing our hands together and watched our breath rise. At one, po <clears throat> At one point, I noticed Ruth had drifted away from the rest of us and was gazing across the field at the sunrise. So, I went over to her and made the suggestion that, since she only wanted to talk to, to the veterans, she swap seats with me. That way she could go on talking at least with Christy and Tommy and I could have some sort of conversation to, conversation too while away the journey. I had hardly finished before Ruth said in a whisper, Why do you have to be so difficult? Now, of all times! I don't get it! Why do you want to make trouble? That she yanked me around. So both our backs were to the others, they wouldn't see if we started to argue. It was the way she did this rather than, the, than her words that suddenly, that suddenly made me see things her way. I could see that Ruth was making a big effort to present not just herself but all of us in the right way to Christine Rodney and here I was threatening to undermine her and start an embarrassing scene. I saw all this, so I touched her on the shoulder and went off back to the to the others. And when we returned to the car, I made sure that the three of us sat exactly as before. But now, as we drove on, Ruth stayed more or less silent, sitting right back in her seat and- Oh, hey! Welcome. Have a seat, have a seat. Ahem. <clears throat> Uh, sitting right back in her seat, and even when Christy and Rodney shouted things to us from the front, Christy and Ro uh, res oh my god, oh my god, even when Christy and Rodney shouted things to us from the front, responded only in sulky monosyllables. Tea, I'm not drinking coffee. Hang on. Okay. Things cheered up considerably, though. Oh, oh, oh. hey, sorry. Eh. Welcome, 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 welcome. Things cheered up considerably, though. Once we arrived in our seaside town. We got there around lunch time and left the rover in a car park beside a mini golf course full of fluttering flags. It had turned to a crisp sunny day and my memory of it is that for the first hour, we all felt so exhilarated to be out and about, we didn't give much thought to what has brought us here. At one point, Rodney actually let out a few whoops, waving his arms around us as he led the way up a road climbing steadily past rows of houses and the occasional shop and you could sense just the and you could sense just from the huge sky oh my god sorry my bracelet just killed itself <laughs> never mind goodness oh wait hang on give me one second this is a mess
Sorry, my bracelet just snapped on its own. I don't even know why. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> my bracelet committed suicide, guys. Hang on. <clears throat> Actually, okay, wait. At one point, Rodney actually let out a few whoops, waving his arms around as he led the way up the road, climbing steadily past rows of houses and the occasional shop. And you could sense just from the huge sky that you were walking towards the sea. Actually, when we did reach the sea, we found we were standing on a road carved into a cliff edge. It seems at first there was a sheer drop down. To the sands, but once you leaned forward over the rail, you could see zigzagging footpaths leading you down the cliff face to the seafront. <coughs> Sorry, we were starving by now and went into a little cafe perched on the cliff, just where one of those footpaths began. And when we went in, the only people inside were the two chubby women in aprons <coughs> who worked there. They were smoking cigarettes at one of those tables, but they quickly got up and disappeared into the kitchen. So when we had the place to ourselves, we took the table right at the back, which meant the one stuck out closest to the cliff edge, and when we sat down, it felt like we were virtually suspended over the sea. I didn't have anything to compare it with at the, at the time, but I realized now the cafe was tiny. It was just three or four little little tables. They had left the window open probably to stop the place filling up with frying smell, so that every now and then a gust of a gust would pass through the wind the room, making all the signs advertising their good deals flutter about. There was one cardboard notice pinned over the counter that had been done in coloured felt tips, and at the top of it it was the word look with a staring with a staring eye drawn inside the O. I see the same thing so often these days, I don't even register it. But back then, I hadn't seen it before, so I was looking at it admiringly, admiringly then caught Ruth's eyes, and realized she too was looking at it amazed, and we both burst out laughing. That was a cozy little moment, when it felt like we had left behind the bad feeling that had grown between us in the car. As it turned out though, it was just about the last moment like that between me and Ruth for the rest of the outing. We hadn't mentioned the possible at all since arriving in the town, and I assumed when we sat down with family, we, we would finally discuss the matter properly. But... Hey, hey. Assume that we said that. But once we had started on our sandwiches, Rodney began talking about their old friend Martin, who had left the cottages the year before and was now living somewhere in the town. Chrissy eagerly took up the subject, and soon both veterans were coming out with anecdotes about all the hilarious things Martin had got up to. We couldn't follow much of it, but Chrissy and Rodney were really enjoying themselves, and they kept exchanging glances and laughing, and although they pretended it was for our benefit, it was clear they were remembering for each other. Thinking about it now, it occurs to me the near taboo at the cottages or surrounding the people who had left might well have stopped them talking about their friend even to each other, and it was only once we had come away they had felt able to indulge themselves in this way. Whenever they laugh, I laugh too just to be polite. Tommy seemed to be seems to be understanding things even less than me and was letting out little hesitant little little half laughs that lags some way behind. Ruth though was laughing and laughing, just kept nodding to everything being said about Martin, just like she too was remembering them. Then once when Chrissy 
made a really obscure reference. She had said something like, Oh yes, this time he put out his jeans. Ruth gave out a big laugh and signaled in our direction, as though to say to Chrissy, Go on, explain to them so that, so that they can enjoy it too. I let this all go, but when Chrissy and Rodney started discussing whether we should go around to Martin's flat, I finally said, maybe a bit coldly, what exactly is he doing here? Why has he got a flat? Hello, 9197. <laughs> Thank you for joining the stream. There was a bit of shifting, then I said, that's what I'm... Wait, sorry, hang on. What exactly is he doing here? Why is he got a flat? There was a silence, then I heard Ruth let out an exasperated sigh. Chrissy leaned over the table towards me and said quietly, like she was explaining to a child. He's being a carer. What else do you think he would be doing here? He's a proper carer now. There was a bit of a shifting, and then I said, that's what I mean. We can't just go and visit him. Chrissy sighed. Okay, we were not supposed to visit carers, absolutely strictly speaking, certainly not encouraged, Rodney chuckled and added, definitely not encouraged naughty naughty to go and visit him, very naughty, Chrissy said and made a touching noise, then Ruth joined in saying, Kathy hates to be naughty, so we better not to go and visit him. Tommy was looking at Ruth, clearly puzzled about whose side she had taken, and I wasn't sure either. It occurred to me that she didn't want the expedition to sidetrack and was reluctantly siding with me, so I smiled at her, and, but she didn't return my look. Then Tommy asked suddenly, Whereabouts was it you saw Ruth possible, Rodney? Oh. Rodney didn't seem nearly so interested in the possible now we were in the town. And I could see anxiety cross Ruth's face. Finally, Rodney said, It was a turning off the high street somewhere up, or up the other end. Of course, it might be her day off. <laughs> then, when no one was saying anything, he added, They do have days off, you know. They're not always at their work. For a moment, as he said this, the fear passed through me that we, has, we had misjudged things badly. That for all we knew, Veterans often talk, used to talk of possibles just as a pretext to go on trips and didn't really expect to take it any further. Ruth might as well have been thinking along the same lines because she was now looking definitely worried. But in the end, she did a little laugh like Rodney had made a joke. Then Chrissy said in a new voice, You know Ruth, we might be coming in here a few years time to visit you working in a nice office. I don't see how anyone could stop us visiting you then. That's right, Ruth said. You can all come and see me. I suppose, Rodney said. There aren't any rules about visiting people if they are working in an office. He laughed suddenly. We don't know. <laughs> it hasn't really happened with us before. It'll be alright, Ruth said. They let you do it. You can all come and visit me. Except Tommy, that is. Tommy looked shocked. Why can't I come? Because you're already with me, stupid. Ruth said, I'm keeping you. We all laughed. Tommy again, a little behind the rest of us. I heard about this girl grew up. This girl up in Wales, Chrissy said. She was Hailsham. Maybe a few years before you lot. Apparently, she's working in this clothes shop right now. A really smart one. There were murmurs of approval, for, and for a while we all looked dreamily out at the clouds. That's Hailsham for you, Rodney said eventually and shook his head as though in amazement. And then, there was that other person, Chrissy had turned to Ruth, that boy you were telling us about the other day, the one who is a couple years above you, who's a park keeper now. Ruth was nodding thoughtfully. It occurred to me that I had... I, it occurred to me that I sh should shoot Tommy a warning glance, but by the time I had turned to him, he had already started to speak. Who was that? He, he asked in a bewildered voice. You know who it is, Tommy? I said. I was, it was too risky to kick him, or even make my voice wink-wink. Chrissy 
would have picked it up in a flash so I said it in dead straight with a bit of wariness like we were all fed up with Tommy forgetting all the time but this just meant Tommy still didn't tweak someone we knew? Tommy, let's not go through this again I said you have to have your brains tested at last, the penny seemed to drop and Tommy shut up Chrissy said I know how lucky I am getting to be at the cottages but you Hailsham lot you are really lucky you know she lowered her voice and leaned forward again there's something that i've been wanting to talk to you lot about it's just that back there at the cottages it's impossible everyone's always listening in she looked around the table then fixed her gaze on ruth rodney suddenly tensed and he too leaned forward and something told me we were coming to what was for to what was for Christy and Rodney the central purpose of this whole expedition. When Rodney and I were up at up in Wales, she said, the same time we heard about this girl in the shop in the clothes in the clothes shop, we heard something else, something about Hailsham students. What they were saying was that some Hailsham students in the past, in special circumstances, had managed to get a defer a deferral. Deferral? Deferral or deferral? Somebody, please. I can't English. I mean, deferral. 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 Deferral! Sorry. Deferral. Had managed to get a deferral. This, that this was something you could do if you were a Hailsham student. You could ask for your donations to be put back by three or even four years. It wasn't easy, but just sometimes they would let you do it. So long you could convince them, so long as you qualified. Chrissy paused and looked at each of us, maybe for dramatic, dramatic effect. Maybe to check us for signs of recognition. Tommy and I probably had, a puz had puzzled looks, but Ruth had on one of her faces where you couldn't tell what was going on. What they said, Chrissy continued, was that if you were a boy and a girl, and you were in love with each other, really, properly in love, and you could show it, then the people who ran Hailsham, they would sort it out for you. They sorted it out so you could have a few years together before you began your donations. There was now a strange atmosphere around the table, a kind of tingle going round. When we were in fail Wales, Chrissy went on, the students at the White Mansion they had heard of this Hailsham couple, the guy, had only a few weeks left before he became a carer and they went to see someone and got everything put back three years. They were allowed to go on living there together, up at the White Mansion, three years straight, didn't have to go on with their training or anything. Sorry, 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 training or anything. Three years just to themselves because they could prove that they were properly in love. It was at this point I noticed Ruth nodding with a lot of, with a lot of authority. Chrissy and Rodney noticed too, and for a few seconds they watched her like they were hypnotized. And I had a kind of vision of Chrissy and Rodney back at the cottages in the months leading up to this moment, probing and prodding the subject between them. I could see them bringing it bringing it up at first very tentatively shrugging and putting it to one side bringing it up again never able to quite to leave it alone i could see them toying with the idea of taking talking to us about it see them refining how they would do it what exactly they would say i look again at chrissy and rodney in front of me gazing at ruth and then try to read their faces chrissy looked both afraid and hopeful rodney look on the edge like he didn't trust himself not to blurt, something, blurt out something he wasn't supposed to. This wasn't the first time I had come across the rumor about deferrals. 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 God! Read properly. Over the past few several weeks, I had caught more and more snatches of it at the cottages. It was always veterans talking among themselves and when any of us show up, they, they would always look awkward and go quiet. But I had heard enough 
get the gist of it and I knew it had specifically to do with, with us Hailsham students. Even so, it was only that day in the seafront cafe that it really come home to me how important this whole notion had become for some veterans. I, I suppose, Christy went on, her voice wobbling slightly. You lot would know about it. The rules, all that sort of thing. She and Rodney look at each other. She and Rodney look at each of us in turn. Then their gazes settled back on Ruth. Ruth sighed and said, Well, they told us a few things, obviously, but she gave a shrug. It's not something we know much about. We never talk about it, really. Anyway, we should get going soon. Who is it that you go to? Rodney suddenly asked. Who did you say you had to go to if you wanted, you know, to apply? Shrug, Roof shrug again. Well, I told you, it wasn't something we talk about much. Almost instinctively, she looked to me and Tommy for support, which was probably a mistake because Tommy said, To be honest, I don't know what you are all talking about. What rules are these? Ruth stares daggers at him, and I quickly said, You know, Tommy, all that talk that used to go around at Hailsham? Tommy shook his head. I don't remember it, he said flatly. And this time I could see Ruth could too, that he wasn't being slow. I don't remember anything like that at Hailsham. Ruth turned away from him. What you have got to realize, she said to Chrissy, is that even though Tommy was at Hailsham, he isn't like a real Hailsham student. He was left out of everything and people were always laughing at him. So there's no point in asking him about anything like this. Now, I want to go and find this person Rodney saw. A look had appeared in top. Tommy's eyes that made me catch my breath. It was one that I had not seen for a long time and that, be and that belonged to the Tommy who had not, who had had to be barricaded inside a classroom while he kicks over the desk. Then the look faded. He turned to the sky outside and let out a heavy sigh. The veterans had not noticed anything because Ruth at the same moment had risen, had risen up to her feet and fiddling with her coat. Then there was a bit of confusion as the rest of us all moved back our chairs from the little table all at once. I had been put in charge of the spending money so I went up to, to pay. The others filed out behind me and while I was waiting for the change, I watched them through one of the big misty windows, shuffling about in the sunshine, not talking, looking down at the sea. Chapter 14 Deferrals, 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 okay. Deferrals, 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 deferrals. Oh my god! Ah! I get nervous and I can't pronounce anything. I'm so sorry, guys. Okay. Also, I don't understand why my bracelet, bracelet decided to kill itself. Now I have all these beads lying around. I don't even know where to put them. Fuck my life. Hang on. Okay, anyway. We are currently reading chapter 14 of Never Let Me Go. Part 2. Part 2, chapter 14. Never Let Me Go by Kazuo Ishiguro. When I got outside, it was obvious the excitement from when we first arrived had evaporated completely. We walked in silence, Rodney leading the way through little back streets hardly penetrated by the sun, the pavement so narrow we often had to shuffle along in single file. It was so, it was a relief to come out onto the high street where the noise made our rotten mood less obvious. As we crossed at a pelican to the to the sunnier, sunnier side, I could see Rodney and Chrissy conferring about something and I wondered how much of the bad atmosphere had to do with their believing we were holding back on some big Hailsham secret and how much was just to do with Ruth's having a go at Tommy. Then once we had crossed the high street, Chrissy announced she and Rodney wanted to go shopping for birthday cards. Ruth was stunned by this but Chrissy just went on. We like to buy them in big batches. It's always cheaper in the long run and you've always got one handy when it's someone's birthday. 
she pointed out at the entrance of a Woolsworth shop. You can get pretty good cards in there really cheap. Rodney was nodding, and I thought there was something a little mocking around the edges of his smile. Of course, he said, you end up with a lot of cards of the same, but you can put your own illustrations on them, you know, personalize them. Both veterans were now standing in the middle of the pavement, letting people with push chairs move around them, waiting for us to put up a challenge. I could tell Ruth was furious, but without Rodney's cooperation, there wasn't much that could be done anyway. So, we went to Woolsworth and, and immediately felt much more cheerful. Even now, I like places that, like that, a large store with lots of aisles displaying bright plastic toys, greeting cards, loads of cosmetics, maybe even a photo booth. Today, if I'm in a, in a town and I find myself with some time to kill, I'll stroll into something like just like that, where you can hang around and enjoy yourself, not buying a thing, and the assistants don't mind at all. Anyway, we went in, and before long, we had wandered apart to look at different aisles. Rodney had stayed near the entrance beside a big rack of cards, and further inside, I spotted Tommy under the big pop group poster rummaging through the music cassettes. After about 10 minutes, when I was near the back of the store, I thought I heard Ruth's voice and wandered towards it. I had already turned into the aisle with one with fluffy animals and big box jigsaw jigsaws before I realized Ruth and Chrissy were standing together at the end of it, having a sort of I cannot read French! Please! Pronunciation. Tete Having a little tete tete. <laughs> Having some sort of tete tete. I wasn't sure what to do. I didn't want to interrupt, but it was time. We were leaving and I didn't want to turn and walk off again. So I just stopped where I was, pretended to examine a jigsaw, and waited for them to notice me. That was when I realized they were back on the subject of this rumor. Chrissy was saying in a lowered voice something like, But all the time you were there, I'm amazed that you didn't think more about how you would do it, about who you would go to and all of that. You don't understand. Ruth was saying, if you were from Hailsham, then you'd see it's never been such a big deal for us. I suppose we have grown, we have always known if we ever wanted to look into it, all we had to do is just get a word back to Hailsham. Ruth saw me and broke off. When I lowered the jigsaw and turned to them, they were both looking at me angrily. At the time, at the same time, it was like I caught them doing something they shouldn't. They move apart self-consciously. It's time we were off, I said, pretending to have heard nothing. But Ruth wasn't fooled. As they came past, as they came past, she gave me a really dirty look. Sorry. So by the time we set off again, following Rodney in search of the office where he had seen Ruth's possible the month before, the atmosphere between us was worse than ever. Things were, weren't helped either by Rodney repeatedly talking us down the wrong streets. At least four times, he led us confidently down a turning off High Street only for the shops and offices to run out, and we, have, we will have to turn and come back. Before long, Rodney was looking defensive and on the verge of giving up, but then we found it. Again, we had turned and heading back, and were heading back towards the High Street when Rodney had stopped suddenly. Then, he indicated silently an office on the other side of the road. There it was, sure enough. It wasn't exactly like the magazine advert we had found on the ground that day. But then, it wasn't so far off either. There was a big glass front at street level. So anyone going by could see right into it. A large open plan room with maybe a dozen desks arranged in irregular L patterns. There were the spotted palms, the shiny machines, sweeping and sweeping desk lamps. People were moving about between desks or leaning on partitions, chatting or sharing jokes, while others had enjoyed their swivel chairs, 
close to look each other, close to each other, and were enjoying coffee and sandwich. Look, Tommy said, it's their lunch break, but they don't go out. Don't blame them either. We kept on staring. It was like a smart, cozy, self-contained world. I glanced at Ruth and noticed her eyes moving anxiously around the faces behind the glass. Okay, Rod, Chrissy said. So which one's the possible? She said this almost sarcastically, like she was sure the whole thing would turn out to be a big mistake on his part. But Rodney, Rodney said quietly with tremor of excitement. There, over there, that corner in the blue outfit. Her talking now to the big red woman. It wasn't obvious, but the longer we kept looking, the more it seemed we, he had something. The woman was around 50 and had kept her figure pretty well. Her hair darker than Ruth's, though it could have been dyed, and she had it tied back in a simple ponytail the way Ruth usually did. She was laughing at something her friend in the red outfit was saying, and her face, especially when she was finishing her laugh with a shake of her head, had, a more, had more than a hint of Ruth about it. We all kept watching her, not saying a word. Then, we became aware that in another part of this office, a couple of the other women had noticed us. One raised a hand and gave us an uncertain wave. This broke the spell and we took to our heels in giggly panic. We stopped again further down the street, talking excitedly all at once except Ruth, that is, who remained silent in the middle of it. It was hard for her to read her face. It was hard to read her face at that moment. She certainly wasn't disappointed, but then she wasn't elated either. She had on a half smile, the sort of a mother might have in an ordinary family, weighing things up while the children jump and scream around her, asking her to say yes, they could do whatever. So there we were all coming out with our views, and I was glad I could say honestly, along with the others, that the woman we had seen was by no means out of the question. But the truth was, we were all relieved, without quite realizing it. We had been bracing ourselves for a letdown, but now we could go back to the cottages. Ruth could take the encouragement from what she had seen, and the rest of us could back her up. And the office life the woman appeared to be leading was about as close as you could hope for to the one that Ruth had, been dis had often described for herself, regardless of what had been going on between us that day. Deep down, None of us want Ruth to return home despondent, and at that moment, we thought we were safe, and so we could, we would have been. I'm pretty sure, had we put an end to the matter at that point. But then, Ruth said, let's sit over there, over that wall, just for a few minutes. Once they have forgotten about us, we can go and have another look. We agreed to this, but as we walked towards the low wall around the small car, car park roof had indicated, Christy said perhaps a little too eagerly. But even if we don't get to see her again, we all agree she's a possible. And it's a, li it's, and it's a lovely office, it really is. J just Let's just wait a few moments, Roof said, then we'll go back. I didn't sit on the wall be myself because it was damped and crumbling, and because I thought someone might reappear any minute and shout at us for sitting there. But Roof did sit on it knees on either side like she was astride a horse and today i have these vivid images of 10 15 minutes we waited there none no one was talking about the possible anymore we were just pretending instead that we were killing a bit of time maybe at a scenic spot during a carefree day trip rodney was doing a little dance to demonstrate what a good feeling there is he gets up on the wall balances along it and then deliberately falls off Tommy is making joke about some passerbys, and though they were not very funny, we were all laughing. Just Ruth, in the middle, astride the wall, remains silent. She keeps the smile on her face, but hardly moves. There's a breeze messing up her hair and the bright winter sun making her crinkle her eyes, so you're not sure if she was smiling at our antics or just grimacing in the light. There are these pictures I kept of those moments we waited by the car park. I suppose we were waiting for Ruth to decide when it was time to go back for a second look. Well, she never got to make that decision because of what happened next. Tommy, who had been mucking about 
on the wall with Rodney suddenly jumped down and went still. Then he said, That's her! That's the same one! We all hoped. We all stopped what we were doing and watched the figure coming out, coming from the direction of the office. She was now wearing a cream-colored overcoat and struggling to, fa to fasten her briefcase as she walked. The buckle was giving her trouble, so she would kept slowing down and starting again. We went on watching her in a kind of trance as she went past to the other side. Then, as she was turning into High Street, Ruth leapt up and said, Let's see where she goes. We came out of our trance and were off after her. In fact, Chrissy had to remind us to slow down or someone would think that we are a gang of muggers or going after the woman. We followed along the high street at a reasonable distance, giggling and dodging past people, separating and coming back together. It must have been around 2 o'clock by then, and the pavement was busy with shoppers. At times, we nearly lost sight of her, but we kept up, loitering in front of window displays when she went into a shop, squeezing past push chairs and old people when she came out again. Then, the woman turned off the high street into the little lanes near the seafront. Chrissy was worried she would notice us away from the crowd, but Ruth just kept going and we followed behind her. Eventually, we came into a narrow street side, narrow side street that had the occasional shop, but was just mainly ordinary house. We had to walk again in a single file, and once when the van came the other way, we had to press ourselves into the houses to let it pass. Before long, there was only the woman and us in the, st in the entire street, and if she glanced back, there was no way she wouldn't have noticed us, but she just kept walking a dozen or so steps ahead, and then Went, in, went through a door into the Portway Studios. I have been back to the Portway Studios a number of times since then. It changed owners a few years ago and now sells all kinds of arty things like pots, plates, play animals. No worries! Go have fun! Sorry. Um, but back then, back then, there was two big white rooms just with paintings, beautifully displayed with plenty of spaces between them. The wooden sign hanging over the door is still the same one though. Anyway, we decided to go in after Rodney. Pointed out how suspicious we look in that quiet little street. Inside the shop, we could at least pretend we were looking at the pictures. We came into the... We came in to find the woman we had been following, talking to a much older woman with silver hair, who seemed to be in charge of the place. They were sitting on either side of the small desk near the door, and apart from them, the gallery was empty. Neither woman paid much attention as we filed past, spread out and tried to look fascinated by the pictures. Actually, preoccupied, though I was with Ruth possible, I did begin to enjoy paintings, the paintings and the sheer peacefulness of the place. It felt like we had come a hundred miles from the, from the high street and the walls and ceilings were peppermint and here and there you could see a bit of fishing net or, or a rotted piece from a boat stuck up high near the cornicing. The paintings too, mostly oils, oils in deep blues and green, had sea themes. Maybe it was tiredness suddenly catching up with us, after all, we have been travelling since dawn, but I wasn't the only one who went off into, into a bit of dream in there. We had all wandered into different corners and were staring at one picture after another, and occasionally making the odd harsh remark like, come, look, come and look at this. All the time, we could hear Ruth possible and the silver-haired lady talking on and on. They weren't especially loud, but in that place, their voices seemed to fill the entire place. They were discussing some man they both knew, how he didn't have a clue about his children, and as we kept on listening to them, stealing the odd glance in their direction, bit by bit, something started to change. It did for me, and I could tell it was happening to the others too. If we left it at seeing the woman through the glass office, even if we followed her through the town, then we lost her. We could still have gone back to the cottages, cottages excited and triumphant. But now, in that gallery, the woman was too close, much closer than we really ever wanted to see. And the more we heard her and looked at her, the less she seemed like Ruth. 
It was a feeling that grew among us tangibly, and I could tell that Ruth, absorbed in the picture on the other side of the room, was feeling it as much as anyone. That was probably why we went on shuffling around the gallery for so long. We were delaying the moment when we have to confer. Then, suddenly the woman had left. We all kept standing about, avoiding each other's eyes. But none of us had thought to follow the woman. And as the seconds kept, kept ticking on, it became like we were agreeing without speaking about how we now saw the situation. Eventually, the silver-haired woman came out from behind her desk and said to Tommy, who was nearest to her, that's a particularly, particularly lovely work. That's one of, that's a, <laughs> that's one a favorite of mine. Tommy turned to her and let out a laugh. Then, as I was hurrying over to help him out, the lady asked, "Are you art students?" "Not exactly," I said to Tom. I said before Tommy could respond, "We're just well keen." The silver-haired lady beamed and then started to tell us how the artist whose works we are looking for, looking at, was related to her, and all about the artist's career thus far. This had the effect, at least, of breaking the trance-like state we had been in and gathered around to, to listen to her, the way we might have done at Hailsham when the Guardian started to speak. This really got the silver-haired lady going and we kept nodding and exclaiming while she talked about where the paintings had been done, the times of the day the artists liked to work, how some had been done without sketches, then there came a kind of natural end to her lecture and we all gave a sigh, thanked her and went out. The street outside being so narrow, we couldn't talk properly for a while long for a while longer and I think we were all grateful for that. As we walked away from the gallery in a single file, I could see Rodney up at the front, theatrically stretching out his arm like he was like he was exhilarated the way he had been he had been when we first arrived in the town but it wasn't convincing and once we came out of the onto the wider street we all shuffled to a halt we were once again near a cliff edge and like before if you peered over the rail you could see the path zigzagging down to the seafront except this time you could see the promenade at the bottom with rows of boarded up stalls we spent a few moments just looking out, letting the wind hit us. Rodney was still trying to be cheerful like he decided not to let any of this business spoil a good outing. He was pointing out to Chrissy something in the sea, way off in the horizon. But Chrissy turned away from him and said, Well, I think we are agreed, aren't we? That isn't Ruth. She gave a small laugh and laid a hand on Ruth's shoulder. I'm sorry. We are all sorry, but we can't blame Rodney really. It wasn't that while that while a try. You've got to admit, when we saw her through the windows, it did look she trailed off, then touched Ruth on the shoulder again. Ruth said nothing but gave a little shrug, almost as if to shrug off the touch. She was squinting into the distance at the sky rather than water. I could tell she was upset, but someone who didn't know her well might well have supposed she was being thoughtful. Sorry, Ruth, Rodney said, and he too gave Ruth a pat on the shoulder, but he had a smile on his face like he didn't expect for one moment to be blamed for anything. It was the way someone apologized when they tried to do you a favor, but it hadn't worked out. Watching Chrissy and Rodney at that moment, I remember thinking, yes, they were okay, they were kind in their way, and were trying to cheer Ruth up. At the same time, though, I remember feeling, even though they were the ones doing the talking, and Tommy and I were silent, a sort of resentment towards them on Ruth's behalf. Because however sympathetic they were, I could see that deep down they were relieved. They were relieved things had turned out the way they had, that they were in a position to comfort Ruth instead of being left behind in the wake of dizzy boost to her hopes. They were relieved they wouldn't have to face more starkly than ever the notion which fascinated and nagged and scared them, this notion of theirs, theirs, that there were all kinds of possibilities open to us Hailsham students that weren't open to them. I remember thinking about then how 
different they actually were. Christian brought me from the three of us. And then Tommy said, I don't see what difference it makes. It was just a bit of fun we were having. A bit of fun for you, maybe, Tommy. Ruth said coldly, still gazing straight ahead of her. You wouldn't think so if it was your possible we had been looking for. I think I would, Tommy said. I don't see how it matters. Even if you found your possible, the actual model they got from you, even then, I don't see what's the difference it makes to anything. Thank you for your profound contribution, Tommy, said Ruth. But I think Tommy's right, I said. It's daft to assume you have the same sort of life as your model. I agree with Tommy. It's just a bit of fun. We shouldn't get so serious about it. I too reached out and touched Ruth on the shoulder. I wanted her to feel the contrast too when Chrissy and Rodney had touched her and then deliberately choose, chose exactly the same spot. I expected some response, some signal that she accepted understanding from me and Tommy in a way she didn't from the veterans, but she gave me nothing. Not even the sh a shrug that she had given Chrissy. Somewhere behind me, I could hear Rodney pacing about, making noises to suggest he was getting chilly in the strong wind. How about going to visit Martin now, he said. His flat's just over there, behind those houses. Ruth suddenly sighed and turned to us. <sighs> to be honest, she said, I knew all along it was stupid. Yeah, said Tommy eagerly. Just a bit of fun. Ruth gave him an irritated look. Tommy, please shut up with all this bit of fun stuff. No one's listening. Then, turning to Christy and Rodney, she went on. I didn't want to say when you first told me about this, but look, it was never on. They don't ever, ever use people like that woman. Think about it. Why would they, why should, why would she want to? We all know it. So why don't we just all face it? We aren't model from that sort. Ruth, I cut in from the Ruth, don't. But she just carried on. We all know it. We are modeled from trash. Junkies, prostitutes, winos, tramps, convicts maybe. Just as long as there aren't psychos. That's what we came from. We all know it. So why don't we just say it? A woman like that, come on. Yeah right, Tommy. A bit of fun. Let's have a bit of fun pretending. That, uh, that other woman in there, her friend, the old one in the gallery, art student. That's what she thought we were. Do you think she would have talked to us like that if she had known what we were? What do you think she would have said if we had asked her? What? Excuse me, but do you think your friend was ever a clone model? She would have thrown us out. We know it, so we might as well just say it. If you want to look for your possibles, if you want to do it properly, then you look in the gutter. You look in the rubbish bins. Look down the toilet. That's where you find where all we call, where we all come from. Ro Ruth, Rodney's voice steady and had a warning in it. Let's forget about it and go see Martin. He's off this afternoon. You'll like him. He's real love. He's a real love. Chrissy put an arm around Ruth. Come on, Ruth. Let's do what Rodney says. Ruth got to her feet and Rodney started to walk. Well, you lot can go on. I said quietly. I'm not going. Ruth turned and looked at me carefully. Well? What do you know? Who's the upset one now? I'm not upset. But sometimes you speak garbage, Ruth. Oh! Look who's upset now. Poor Kathy. She never likes talking straight. It's nothing to do with that. I don't want to visit a carer. We are not supposed to. We are not supposed to, and I don't even know this guy. Ruth shrugged and exchanged glances with Chrissy. Well, she said, there's no reason we've got to go around together the whole time. If little Miss here doesn't want to join us, she doesn't have to. Let her go off by herself. Then she leaned over to Chrissy and said in a stage whisper, "That's always the best way when Kathy is in mood. Leave her alone, and she'll walk it off." Be back at the car by 4 o'clock, Rodney said to me. Otherwise, you have to hitchhike. Then he did a laugh. Come on, Kathy. Don't get in sulk. Come with us. No, you go on. I don't I don't feel like it. Rodney shrugged and be started, started to move off again. Ruth and Chrissy followed. But Tommy didn't move. Only when Ruth stared at him did he say, I'll stay with Kath. If we are, sp if we are splitting, then I'll stay with Kath. Ruth glared at him with fury. 
then turned and strode off. Chrissy and Rodney, Rodney looked at Tommy awkwardly, then they too began walking again. That was chapter 14. Chapter 15. Let us continue. Tommy and I leaned on the rail and stared at the view until the others had gone out of sight. It's just talk. He eventually said, then after a pause, It's just what people say when they are feeling sorry for themselves, it's just talk. The guardians never told us anything like that. I started to walk, to walk the opposite way to the, uh, to the others and let Tommy fall instead beside me. It's not worth getting upset about, Tommy went on. Ruth's always doing things like that now, it's just her letting off steam. Anyway, like we are telling her, even if it's true, even a little bit is true, I don't see how it makes any difference. Our models, what they were like, that's nothing to do with us, Kath. It's just not worth getting upset about. Okay, I said, and deliberately bumped my shoulder into his. Okay, okay. I had the impression we were walking towards the town center, though I couldn't be sure. I was trying to think of a way to, ex to change the subject when Tommy said first. You know when we were at the Woolsworth place earlier? When you were down at the back at the uh, when you were down at the back with the others? I was trying to find something, something for you. A present? I look at him in surprise. I'm not sure Ruth would approve that of that. Not not unless you got her a bigger one. Ah <sighs> a sort of present, but I couldn't find it. I wasn't going to tell you but now well, I've got another chance to find it, except you might have to help me. I'm not good. I'm not very good at shopping. Tommy, what are you talking about? You want to get me a present, but you want me to help you to choose it. No, 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 no. I know what it is. It's just that he laughed and shrugged. <laughs> oh, I might as well just tell you. In that shop we were in, they had this shelf with loads of records and tapes, so I was looking for the one that you lost that time. Do you remember, Kev? Except I couldn't remember what it was anymore. My tape? I didn't realize you ever knew about it, Tommy. Oh yeah, Ruth was getting people to look for it and saying that you were really upset about losing it, so I tried to find it. I never told you at, th at that time, but I did try really hard. I thought there would be places I could look where you couldn't, in the boys' room, uh, in, in the boys' dorms, stuff like that. I remember looking for ages and I couldn't find it. I glanced at him and felt my rotten mood evaporating. I never knew that, Tommy. That was really sweet of you. Well, it didn't help much, but I really wanted to find it for you. And when it looked like in when it looked in the end like I wasn't going to, to turn up, and and when it looked in the end like it wasn't going to turn up, I just said to myself, one day I'll go to Norfolk and find it, find it there for her. The lost corner of England, I said, and looked around me. And here we are! Tommy too looked around him, and we came to a halt. We were in another side street, not as narrow as the gallery, as the one with the gallery. For a moment, we both kept glancing around, theatrically, and giggled. So it wasn't such a daft idea, Tommy said. That Wool's Wolf shop earlier, it had all these tapes, so I thought they were bound to have yours, but I don't think they did. You don't think they did? Oh, Tommy. You mean you didn't even look properly? I did, Kath. It's just that, well, it's really annoying, but I couldn't remember what it was called. All the time at Hailsham, I was opening boys' collection chests and everything. Now, but now I can't remember. It was Julie Bridges or something? Judy Bridgewater, Songs After Dark. Tommy shook his head solemnly. They definitely didn't have that. I laughed and punched his arm. He looked puzzled, so I said, Tommy, they wouldn't have something like that in the Woolsworth. They have the latest hits. Judy Bridgewater, she's someone from ages ago. It just happened to turn up at one of our sales. It's not going to be in Woolsworth now, you idiot. Well, like I said, I don't know about things like that, but they had so many tapes. They had some, Tommy. Oh, never mind. It was a sweet idea. I'm really touched. A really great idea. This is Norfolk, after all. We started walking again, and Tommy said hesitantly, 
Well, that's what I wanted to tell. That's what I had to tell you. I wanted to surprise you, but it's useless. I don't know where to look, even if I do know the name of the record. Now I've told you, you can help me. We can look for it together. Tommy, what are you talking about? I was trying to sound reproachful, but I couldn't help laughing. Well, we've got over an hour. This is a real chance. Tommy, you stupid idiot. You really believe it, don't you? All this lost car lost corner stuff? I don't necessarily believe it. But we might as well look now that we are here. I mean, you would like to find it again, wouldn't you? What, what have we got to lose? Alright, you are a complete idiot. But alright. He opens his arms up. Out. He opens his arms out helplessly. Well, Cass, where do we go? Like I said, I'm not good at shopping. We have to look in second-hand places, I said after the moment's thought. Places full of old clothes, old books. They'll sometimes have boxes full of records and tapes. Okay, but where are these shops? When I think of that moment now, standing with Tommy in the little side street about to begin our search, I feel a warm feeling. A warmth welling up, welling through me. Everything suddenly felt perfect. An hour set aside, stretching ahead of us, and there wasn't a better way to spend it. I had to really hold myself from giggling stupidly or jumping up and down on the pavement like a little kid. Not long ago, when I was caring for Tommy, and I brought up our Norfolk trip, he told me he had felt exactly the same. The moment when we decided to go searching for my lost tape, it was like suddenly everything, suddenly every cloud had blown away and we had nothing but fun and laughter before us. At the start, we kept going into the wrong sort of places, secondhand bookshops or shops full of old vacuum. Thank you. Shops full of old vacuum cleaners, but no music at all. After a while, Tommy decided I didn't know any better than he did and announced he would lead the way. As it happened, by sheer luck, he discovered straight away a street with four shops of just the kind we were after, standing virtually in a row. The fronts were full of dresses, handbags, animal annals. Uh, sorry, children annals. Oh my god. I don't know why I see children as animals. Maybe they are. Children's annals and... When you went inside, a sweet stale smell. There were piles of creased paper bags, dusty boxes full of postcards and trinkets. One shop specialized in hippie stuff, while another had war medals and war medals and photos of soldiers in the des desert. But they all had somewhere a big cardboard box of two, cardboard box or two with LPs and cassette tapes. We rummaged around those shops and in all honesty after the first few minutes i think judy bridgewater had more or less leaped through from our mind we were just enjoying looking through all those things together drifting apart then finding ourselves side by side again maybe competing for the same box of bric-a-brac in a dusty corner lit up by the shaft of, shaft of sun then of course i found it i've been flicking through a narrow Sorry, a true my god, what's my reading today? I've been flicking through a row of cassette cassette cases, my mind on other things, when suddenly there it was, under my fingers, looking just the way it had all those years ago. Judy, her secret, the coquettish for look for the barman, the blurred palm in the background. I didn't exclaim the way I had been doing when I come across other items that mildly excited me. I stood there quite still looking at the plastic case, unsure whether or not I was delighted. For a second, it even felt like a mistake. The tape had been the perfect excuse for all this fun and now it had turned up and we would have to stop. Maybe that was why, to my own surprise, I kept silent at first. Why I thought about pretending never to have seen it. And now it was there, in front of me. There was something vaguely embarrassing about the tape, like it was something I should have grown out of actually went as far as flicking the cassette on and letting its neighbor fall on it. But there was but there was the spine looking up at me and in the end I called Tommy over. Is that it? He seemed genuinely skeptical. Perhaps because I wasn't making a big fuss. I pulled it out and held it in both hands. 
then suddenly I felt a huge pleasure and something else, something more complicated than threatened to make me burst into tears. But I got hold of the emotion and just gave Tommy, Tommy's arm a tug. Yes, this is it, I said. For the first time, smiled excitedly. Can you believe it? We have really found it? Do you think it could be the same one? I mean, the actual one that you have lost? As I turned it in my fingers, I found I could remember all the design back on the back and the titles of the tracks, everything. For all I know, it might be, I said. But I have to tell you, Tommy, there might be thousands of these knocking about. Then, it was my turn to notice Tommy wasn't as triumphant as he might be. Tommy? You don't seem very pleased for me, I said, though in an obviously jokey voice. I am pleased for you, Kev. It's just that, well, I wish I had found it. Then he did a small laugh and went on. Back then, when you lost it, I used to think about it in my head. What it would be like if I found it and brought it to you. What you would say, your face and all of that. His voice was softer than usual and he kept his eyes on the plastic case in my hand. And I suddenly became very conscious conscious of the fact that we were the, the only people in the shop except for the old guy behind the counter at the front and gross and gross in his paperwork we were right at the back of the shop on the raised platform where it was darker and more secluded like the old guy didn't want to think about the stuff in our area and had mentally curtained it off for several seconds tommy stayed in a sort of trance but all we, for all i know playing over his mind one of these fantasies of giving me back my lost tape. Then suddenly he snatched the case out of my hand. Well, at least I can buy it for you. He said with a grin, and before I could stop him, he started he started down the floor towards the front. I went on browsing around the back of the shop while the old guy searched around for the tape to go with the case. I was still feeling a pang of regret that we had found it so quickly, and it was only later when we were back at the cottages I was alone in my room. That I really appreciated having the tape and that song back again. Even then, it was mainly a nostalgia thing. And today, if I happen to get the tape out and look at it, it brings back memories of the afternoon in Norfolk, every bit as much as it does our Hailsham days. As we came out from the shop, I was keen to regain the carefree, almost silly mood that we had been in before. But when I made a few little jokes, Tommy was lost in thoughts and didn't respond. We began to going up a steeply climbing path and we could see maybe a hundred yards further up a kind of viewing area right off the cliff where benches falling out to the sea. It would have made a nice spot for, for the summer for an ordinary family to sit and eat a picnic. Now, despite the chilly wind, we found ourselves walking up towards it. But when there was still some way left to go, Tommy slowed to a dawdle and said to me, Chrissy and Rodney, they're really obsessed with this idea, you know? The one about people having their donations deferrals if they are really in love. They're convinced we know all about it. But no one said anything like that at Hailsham. At least, I never heard anything like that. Did you, Kath? No, it's just something going on going around recently among the veterans and people like Ruth, they have been stoking it up. I looked at him carefully, but it was hard to tell if he had just spoken with a mischievous affection or else a kind of disgust. I could see anyway there was something else in his mind, nothing to do with Ruth, so I didn't say anything and w waited. Eventually, he came up to a complete halt and, and started to poke around with his foot a squash paper cup on the ground. Actually, Kath, he said, I've been thinking about it for a, for a while. I'm sure you we were right. There were no talk like that when we were at Hailsham, but there were a lot of things that didn't make sense back then. And I've been thinking, if it's true, this rumor, when it could explain quite a lot, stuff we used to puzzle over. What do you mean? What sort of stuff? The gallery, for instance. Tommy had lowered his voice, and I stepped in closer just as we were still at, at Hailsham, talking in dinner queue or beside the pond. We never got to the bottom of it. What the gallery was for? Why Madame took away all the best of best works? But now I think I know. 
test. You remember the time when everyone was arguing about tokens, whether they should get them or not, to make up for the stuff that they had been taken away by Madame. And Roy J went in to see Miss Emily about it. Well, there was something Miss Emily said then, something she had let drop, and that was what has been making me think. Two women were passing with dogs on leads, and although it was completely stupid, we both talking. We both stopped talking until they had gone further up the slope and out of earshot. Then I said, "What thing, Tommy? What thing, Miss Emily let drop?" When Roy J asked her, "Why, Madame?" took our stuff away, do you remember what he su she's supposed to have said? I remember her saying it was a privilege and we should be proud. But that wasn't all. Tommy's voice was now down to a whisper. What she told Roy was she slipped, which probably, which she probably didn't mean to let slip. Do you remember, Kath? She told Roy that things like pictures, poetry, all that kind of stuff she said they reveal what you were like inside. She said they reveal your soul. When he said this, I suddenly remembered a drawing Laura had done once in her once of her intestines and laughed. But something was coming back to me. That's right, I said. I remember. So what are you getting at? What I think, said Tommy slowly, is this. Suppose it's true. What the veterans were saying. Suppose some special arrangement had been made for Hailsham students. Suppose two people say they are truly in love and they want extra time to be together. Then you see, Cass, there has to be a way to judge if they are really telling the truth. That they aren't just saying that they are in love just to defer their donations. You see how difficult it could be to decide. Or a couple might really believe they are in love, but it's just a sex thing, or just a crush. You see what I mean, Kath? It's really hard to judge, and it's probably impossible to get it right every time. But the point is, whoever decides, Madame or, or whoever it is, they need something to go on. I nodded slowly. So that's why they took our art away. It could be. Madame's got a gallery somewhere filled with stuff by students from when they were tiny. I suppose two people come up and say that they are in love. They can find the art they have done over the years and years. They can see if they can, they go, if they match. Don't forget it, Kev. What she has got reveals our souls. You could she could decide for herself what a good match, what's a good match, and what's a stupid crush. I started to walk slowly again. Hardly looking in front of me, Tommy fell in step, waiting for my response. I'm not sure, I said in, in the end. What you are saying could certainly explain Miss Emily, what she said to Roy, and I suppose it explains why the Guardians always thought it was so important for us to be able to paint and all of that. Exactly. And that's why... Tommy sighed and went on with some effort. That's why Miss Lucy had to admit she had been wrong telling me that it didn't matter. She had said that because she she was sorry for me at that time. But she knew deep down it did matter. The thing about being from Hailsham was that you had this special chance and if you didn't get stuff into Madame's gallery then you were as good as throwing the chance away. It was after he said this it suddenly dawned on me with a real chill where this was leading. I stopped and turned to him, before, and be, but before I could speak, Tommy let out a laugh. If I got this right then, well, it looks like I might have blown my chance away. Tommy, did you ever get anything into the gallery? When were you much, when, when you were much younger maybe? He was shaking his head. You know how useless I was? And there was what, and there was that stuff with Miss Lucy. I know she meant well, she was sorry for me and she, well, she wanted to help me. I'm sure she did, but if my theory is right, well, it's only a theory, Tommy, I said. You know what your theories are like. I wanted, think, I wanted to let in things a bit, but I couldn't get the tone right. And it must have been obvious I was still thinking hard about what he had just said. Maybe they have got all sorts of ways to judge, I said after a moment. Maybe the art... It's just one out of all kinds of different ways. 
Tommy shook his head again. Like what? Madame never got to know us. She wouldn't remember us individually. Besides, it's probably not just Madame that decides. There's probably people higher up than her, than her. People who never set foot in Hailsham. I thought about this a lot, Kath. It's all fits. That's why the gallery was so important and why the guidance wanted us to work so hard on our art and our poetry. Kath, Kath, what are you thinking? Sure enough, I drifted off a little. A little bit. Actually, I was thinking about that afternoon I had been alone in our dorm playing the tape we had just found. How I was swaying around, clutching a pillow to my breast and how Madame had been watching me from the doorway, tears in her eyes. Even this episode for which I had I would nev I had never yet found a convincing explanation seems to fit Tommy's theory. In my head, I had been imagining I was holding a baby, but of course there's no there's have been no way for Madame to know that. She had been supposed I was holding a lover in my arms. If Tommy's theory was right, if Madame was connected to us for the sole purpose of deferring our donations when later on we fell in love, then it made sense for all her usual coldness towards us. She would be really moved some stumbling on scene like on a scene like that. All this flashed through my mind and I was on the point of blurting it all out to Tommy. But I held back because I wanted now to play down his theory. I was just thinking over what you said, that's all, I said. We should start going back. It might take us a while to find the car park. We began to retrace our steps down the slope, but we knew we still had time and didn't hurry. Tommy, I asked, after we had been walking for a while. Have you said any of this to Ruth? He shook his head and went on walking. Eventually, he said, the thing is, Ruth believes it all. Everything the veterans are saying. Okay. She likes to pretend she knows much more than she does, but she does believe it and sooner or later she's gonna act, she's gonna want to take take it further. You mean she'll want to? Yeah, she'll want to apply, but she hadn't thought it through yet. Not the way we just did. You have never told her your theory about the gallery? He shook his head again but said nothing. If you tell her your theory, I said, and she buys it, well she's gonna be furious. Tommy seemed thoughtful, but still didn't say anything. It wasn't until we were back down in a narrow side street that he, that he spoke again. Then his voice was suddenly sheepish. Actually, Kath, he said, I have been doing some stuff, just in case. I haven't told anyone, not even Ruth. It's just a start. That was when I first heard about his imaginary animals. When he started to describe what he was doing, I didn't actually see anything until a few weeks later. I found it hard to show any enthusiasm. In fact, I have to admit, I was reminded of the original elephant in grass picture that had started off all Tommy's problem at Hailsham. The inspiration, he explained, had come from an old children's book with the back cover missing, which he found behind one of the sofas at the cottages. Then he then he then persuaded the Kaffirs uh, he then persuaded the Kaffirs to give him one of the one of the little notebook he scribbled his figures in and since then Tommy had finished at least a dozen of his fantastic creatures. The thing is, I'm doing them really small, tiny. I had never thought of it at Hilsham. I think maybe that's where I went wrong. If you make them tiny and you have too because the pages are only about this big that everything changes it's like they come to life by themselves you have to draw in all these little different details for them you have to think about how they had protect themselves how they had reached things honest Kath, it's nothing like anything i had did in hailsham he started describing his favorites, but I couldn't really concentrate. The more excited he got telling me about his animals, the more uneasy I was growing. Tommy, I wanted to say to him, you're going to make yourself a laughing stock all over again. Imaginary animals? What's up with you? But I didn't. I just looked at him cautiously and kept saying, that sounds really good, Tommy. Then he said at one point, like I said, Kath, Ruth doesn't know about the animals. 
And when he said that he seems to remember everything else and why we had been talking about his animals in the first place and the energy faded from from his face, then we were walking in silence again and he we and as we came out onto the high street I said, Well, even if there's something to your theory, Tommy, there's a lot more we'll have to find out. For one thing, how's a couple supposed to apply? What are they supposed to do? They aren't exactly forms lying about. I've been wondering about that, all of that too. His voice was quiet and solemn. As far as I, as I can see, they had only one obvious way to start, and that's to find Madame. I gave this a think, and then said, that might not be so easy. We don't really know a thing about her. We don't even know her name. And we remember how she was? She didn't even like us coming near her. Even if we did ever track her down, I don't see her helping much. Tommy sighed. I know, he said. Well, I suppose we got time. None of us are in any particular hurry. By the time we got back to the car park, the afternoon had clouded over and was growing pretty chilly. There was no sign of the others yet, so Tommy and I leaned against our car and looked towards the mini golf course. No one was playing, and the flags were fluttering away in the wind. I didn't want to talk anymore about Madame, the, glad the gallery, or any of the rest of it. So I got the Judy Bridgewater tape out of the little bag and gave it a good look over. Thanks for buying it. Buying, buying this for me, I said. Tommy smiled. If I got to the tape box and you were on the, the LPs, I would have found it first. It was bad luck for poor old Tommy. It doesn't make any difference. We only found it because you said to, to look for it. I had forgotten about all this lost corner stuff and Ruth was going on like that. I was in such a mood. Judy Bridgewater, my old friend. It's like she has never been away. I wonder who stole it back then. For a moment, we turned towards the street, looking for the others. You know, Tommy said, when Ruth said what she did earlier on, and I saw how upset you look, leave it, Tommy. I'm alright about it now, and I'm not going to bring it up with her when she comes back. No, that's not what I'm getting at. He took his weight off the car, turned and pressed a foot against the front tire as though to test it. What I meant was, I realized then when you Ru when Ruth came out with all of that, I realized why you keep looking through those porn magazines. Okay, I haven't realized. It's just a theory, another of my theories. But when Ruth said what she did earlier on, it kind of clicked. I knew he was looking at me, but I kept my eyes straight ahead and made no response. But I still don't really get it, Kath, he said eventually. Even if what Ruth says is right, and I don't think it is, why are you looking through old porn magazines for your possibles? Why would your model have to be the one of those girls? I shrugged, still not looking at him. I don't claim it make any sense. It's just something I do. There were tears filling my eyes now, and I tried to hide them from Tommy, but my voice wobbled as I said, If it annoys you so much, I won't do it anymore. I don't know if Tommy saw, my, saw the tears. If any, in any case, I'd got them under my under control by the time he came close to me and gave my shoulder a squeeze. This was something he had done before from time to time. It wasn't anything special or new, but somehow I did feel better and gave a little laugh. He let go of me then, then we, but we stayed almost touching side by side again, our backs to the car. Okay, there's no sense in it, in it I said. But we all do it, don't we? We all wonder about our model. After all, that's why we came out here today. We all do it. Kaz, you know, you, you know, don't you? I haven't told anyone about the time in the boiler hut. Not Ruth, not anyone. But I just don't get it. I don't get what it's about. Alright, Tommy, I'll tell you. It may not make, a make any more sense after you have heard it, but you can hear it anyway. It's just that sometimes, every now and then, I get these really strong feelings when I want to have sex. Sometimes it just comes over me and for an hour or, so, or two, it's scary. For all I know, I could end up doing it with all Kaffirs. It's that bad. That's why. That's the only reason I did it with Hugh and with Oliver. It didn't mean anything deep down. I don't even like them that much. I don't know what it is, and afterwards, when it passed over, it's just it's just scary. That's why I started thinking, well, 
it has to come from somewhere. It must be to do with the way I am. I stopped. But when Tommy didn't say anything, I went on. So I thought if I find her picture in one of those magazines, at least it will explain it. I wouldn't want to go and find her or anything. It would just, you know, kind of explain why I am the way I am. I get it too sometimes, said Tommy. When I feel like really doing it, I reckon everyone else does too, if they are honest. I don't think there's anything different about you, Kath. In fact, I get like that quite a lot. He broke off and laughed, but I didn't laugh with him. What I'm talking about is different, I said. I have watched other people. They get in the mood for it, and that doesn't make them do things. They never do things that I have done, going on with people like you. I might have started crying again because I felt Tommy's arm going back around my shoulders. Upset as I was, I remained conscious of where we were, and I made kind of check in, in my mind that if Ruth and the others came up to the street, even if they saw us at that moment, there would be no room for misunderstanding. We are still side by side, leaning, leaning against the car. They would see that I was upset about something and Tommy was just comforting me. Then I heard him say, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. Once you find someone, Kath, someone you really want to be with, then it could really be good. Remember what the Guardians used to tell us? If it's with the right person, it makes you feel really good. I made a movement with my shoulder to get Tommy's arm off me, then took a deep breath. Let's forget it. Anyway, I've got so much better at controlling those moods when they come on, so let's just forget it. All the same, Kath, it's stupid looking through those magazines. It's stupid, okay, Tommy? Let's leave it. I'm alright now. I don't remember what else we talked about until the others showed up. We didn't discuss any more of those serious things, and if the others sensed something still in the air, they didn't remark on it. They were in good spirits, and Ruth in particular seemed determined to make up for the bad scene earlier on. She came up and touched my cheek, saying some joke or other, and once we got in the car, she made sure the jovial mood kept going. She and Chrissy had found everything about Martin comical and were relishing the chance to laugh openly about him now they had left his flat, Rodney looked disapproving, and I realized Ruth and Chrissy were making a song and dance of it mainly to tease him. It all seemed good natured enough, but what I noticed was that whereas before Ruth would have taken the opportunity to keep me and Tommy in the dark about the jokes and references throughout the journey back, she kept turning to me and explaining carefully everything they were talking about. In fact, it got a bit tiring after a while because it was like everything being said in the car was for our, or at least, my special benefit. But I was pleased with Ruth being... I was pleased with Ruth's, Ruth was making such a fuss. I understood, as did Tommy, that she had recognized she had behaved badly before and this was her way of admitting it. We were in... We were sitting with her in the middle, just as we had done on the journey out, but now she had spent all her time talking to me, turning occasionally to the other side to give Tommy a little squeeze or the odd kiss. It was a good atmosphere, and no one brought up Ruth possible or anything like that, and I didn't mention the Judy Bridgewater tape Tommy had bought me. I knew Ruth would have found out about it sooner or later, but I didn't want her to find out just yet. On that journey home, with the darkness settling over in those long empty roads, it felt like the three of us were close again and I didn't want anything to come along and break that mood. That was chapter 15. Give me one moment. stretch for this. Ah, my poor bracelet. What do I do? Oh, okay. Yeah. Hi. 
Alrighty. Let's continue chapter 16. We have two chapters to go before we end the stream. Stretch. And copy. <laughs> Someone's very busy today. <laughs> Chapter 16. Uh, hang on, let me keep my phone for a quick second. Nothing, nothing interesting. Uh, one minute for toilet break. Bye bye. Chapter 16, let's go! Chapter 16 <sighs> The odd thing, the odd thing about our Norfolk trip was that once we got back, we hardly talked about it. So much so that for a while, all kinds of rumors went around about what we had been up to. Even then, we kept pretty quiet until eventually people lost interest. One moment, please. I'm 
still not sure why this happened. Perhaps we felt it was up to Ruth, that it was her call how much got told, and we were waiting to take our cue from her. And Ruth, for one reason or another, maybe she was embarrassed how things had turned out with her possible, maybe she was enjoying the mystery, had remained completely close on the subject. Even among ourselves, we avoided talking about the trip. The air of secrecy made it easier for me to keep from telling Ruth about Tommy buying me the Judy Bridgewater tape. I didn't go as far as actually hiding the thing. It was always there in my collection, in one of my little piles next to the skirting board. But I always made sure not to leave it out or on top of the pile. There were times when I wanted badly to tell her, when I wanted us to re reminisce about Hailsham with the tape playing in the background, but the further away we got from the Norfolk trip and I still hadn't told her, the more it came to feel like a guilty secret. Of course, she did spot the tape in the end much later, but and it was probably a much worse time for her to find it, but that's the way your luck sometimes goes. As spring came on, there seemed to be more and more veterans leaving to start their training, and though they left without fast in the usual way, the increased numbers made, the, made them impossible to ignore. I'm not sure what our feelings were witnessing these departures. I suppose, to some extent, we envied people leaving. It did feel like they were headed for, they were headed for bigger, more exciting world. But of course, without a doubt, their going made us increasingly uneasy. Then, as I think it was around April, Alice F became the first of our Hailsham bunch to leave, and not long after, Gordon C did too. They had both asked to start their training, and went off with cheerful smiles. And after that, for our lot anyway, the atmosphere at the cottages changed forever. Many veterans, too, seemed affected by the flurry of departures, and maybe as a direct result, there was a fresh spate of rumours of the sort that Chrissy and Rodney had spoken about in Norfolk. Talk went, ar around <coughs> talk went around students somewhere else in the country, getting, differ getting deferrals because they had shown that they were in love, and now, just sometimes, the talk was of students with no connections to Hailsham. Here again, the five of us who had been to Norfolk back away from these topics, even Chrissy and Rodney, who had once been at the centre of just this sort of talk, now look awkwardly away when these rumours got going. The Norfolk effect even got to me and Tommy. I've been assuming once we were back, we'll be taking little opportunities whenever we are alone to exchange more thoughts about his theory on the gallery. But for some reason, and it wasn't any more of him than me, this never really happened. The one exception, I suppose, was that time in the goose house the morning when he showed me his imaginary animals. The barn, we call the goose house, was on the outer fringes of the cottages because the roof leaked badly and the door was permanently off his off its off his its hinges. It was it wasn't used for anything other than a place for couples to sneak off in warmer months. By then I had taken a I had taken to going for long solitary walks and I think I was settling out on one of these and had just gone past the goose house when I heard Tommy calling me. I turned to see him in his bare feet, perched awkwardly in, in, on a bit of a dry ground surrounded by huge puddles, one hand on the side of the barn to keep his balance. What happened to your wellies, Tommy? I asked. Aside from his bare feet, he was dressed in his usual, usual thick jumper and jeans. I was, you know, drawing, he laughed held up a little black notebook similar to the ones Kefirs always went around with. It was by then over two months since the Norfolk trip, but I realized as soon as I saw the notebook what this was about. But I waited for him to say, If you like, Cass, I'll show you. He led the way into the goose house, hopping over the jaggy road, jaggy ground. I expected it to be dark inside, but the sunlight was pouring through the skylight. Pushed against one wall where various bits of furniture heaved out over the past year or so, broken tables, old, fr old fridges, that kind of thing. 
Tommy appeared to have dragged into the middle of the floor a two-seater settee with stuffing poking out of its black plastic, and I guess he had been sli- sitting in sitting in it doing his drawing when I had gone past. Just nearby, his Wellingtons were fall- lying fallen on their sides, his football his football socks peeking out the tops. <coughs> Tommy jumped back onto the settee, nursing his big toe. Sorry, my feet pull a bit. I took everything off without realizing. I think I cut myself now. Cast, do you want to see this? Ruth looked at them last week, so I've been meaning to show you ever since. No one's seen them apart from Ruth. Have a look, Cath. That was when I first saw his animals. When he had told me about them in Norfolk, I had seen in my mind scaled down versions of the sort of pictures we had done when we were small. So I was taken aback at how densely detailed each one of each one was. In fact, it took a moment to see they were a- they were animals at all. The first impression was like one you would get if you took back off the radio set. Tiny canals, weaving tendons, miniature screws and wheels were all drawn on obsessive precision and only when you held the page away could you see it was some kind of armadillo say or a bird it's my second book tommy said there's no way there's no way anyone seeing the first one it took me a while to get going sorry he was lying back on the settee now tugging a sock over his foot trying to sound casual but i knew he was anxious for my reaction even so For some time, I didn't come up with the wholehearted praise. Maybe it was partly my worry that any artwork was liable to get him into trouble all over again. But also, what I was looking at was so different from anything the Guardians had taught us to do at Hailsham. I didn't know how to judge it. I did say something like, God, Tommy, this must have taken so much concentration. I'm surprised you can see well enough here to do all this tiny stuff. And then, as I flicked through the pages, perhaps because I was still struggling to find the right thing to say, I came out with, I wonder what Madame would say if she saw this. I say in a jokey tone. Tommy responded with a little snigger. But then, there was something hanging in the air that that hadn't been there before. I went on turning the pages of the notebook. It was about a quarter full, not looking up at him, wishing I had never brought up Madame. Finally, I heard him say, I suppose I'll have to get a lot better before she gets to see any of it. I wasn't sure if this this, this was a cue for me to say how good the drawings were, but by this time, I was becoming genuinely drawn to these fantastical creatures in front of me. For all their busy metallic features there was something sweet even vulnerable about each one of them i remembered him telling me in norfolk that he worried even as he created them how they would protect themselves and be able to reach and fetch things and looking at them now i could see the same sort of concern even so for some reason i couldn't fathom something continued to stop me coming out of praise then tommy said anyway it's not because of all that i'm doing the animals it's just that i like doing them i was wondering Kath, if i should go on keeping it a secret i was thinking maybe there's no harm in people people knowing i do this hannah still does her watercolors and a lot of veterans do stuff i don't mean i'm going to go around showing everyone exactly but i was thinking well maybe there's no reason why i should keep it all secret anymore at last, I was able to look up at him and say with some conviction, Tommy, there's no reason. No reason at all. These are good. Really, really good. In fact, if that's why you're hiding it in here now, it's really daft. He didn't say anything in response, but a kind of smirk appeared over his face. Like he was enjoying a joke with himself. And I knew how happy i have made him. I don't think we smoked we spoke much more to each other after that i think before long he got his wellington on and we both left the goose goose house as i say that was the only time tommy and i touched directly on his theory that spring then the summer came the one year point from 
we had first arrived. A batch of new students turned up in the minibus, minibus, much as we had done, but none of them were from Hailsham. This was some ways a relief. I think we had all been getting an anxious about how a fresh lot of Hailsham students might complicate things. But for me, at least, this non-appearance of Hailsham students just added to a feeling that Hailsham was now far away in the past and that the ties binding our crowd were fraying. It wasn't just that people like Hannah were always talking about following Alice's example and starting their training. Others like Laura had found boyfriends who weren't Hailshams and you could all almost forget they had ever had much to do with us. And then, there was the way Ruth kept pretending to forget things about Hailsham. Okay, these were mostly trivial things but I got more and more irritated with her. There was a time, for instance, we were sitting around the kitchen table after a long breakfast and roofed me and a few veterans. One of the veterans had been talking about how eating cheese late at night had disturbed your sleep and I turned to Ruth to say something like, You remember how Miss Jaredin always used, used to tell us that? It was just a casual aside and all it needed for Ruth is to smile or not. But she made it a point of staring at me blankly like she didn't have the faintest idea of what I was talking about. Only when I said to the, to the veterans by the way of, of explanation, oh, it's one of our guardians, did Ruth give a frowning nod as though she had just the moment remembered. I let her get away with it at, at the time but there was another occasion when I didn't. The evening we were sitting out in the ruined bus, bus shelter. I got angry then because it was one of it was one thing to play this game in front of the veteran, quite another one it was just the two of us in the middle of a serious talk. I had referred just in passing to the fact that at Hailsham the shortcut down to the pond through the rhubarb part patch was out of bounds. When she put on her puzzled look, I abandoned whatever point I had been trying to make and said, Ruth, there's no way you have forgotten, so don't give me that. Perhaps if I had if I had not pulled her up so sharply, perhaps if I had made a joke out of it and carried on, she would have seen how absurd it was and laughed. But, but because I had snapped at her, Ruth glared back and said, What does that what does it matter anyway? What's the rhubarb patch got to do with any of this? Just get on with what you're saying. It was getting late. The summer evening was fading. And the old bus shelter felt musty and damp after a recent thunderstorm. So I had so I didn't have the head to go into why it mattered so much. And though I did just drop it and carry on with the other discussion that we are having we have been having, the atmosphere had gone chilly and could hardly have helped us get through the difficult matter in hand. But to explain what we were talking about that evening, I'll have to go back a little bit. In fact, I'll have to go back several weeks to the earlier part of the summer. I had been having a relationship with one of the, one of the veterans, a boy called Lenny, which to be honest, had mainly about the sex. But then, he had suddenly opted to start his training and left. This unsettled me a little and Ruth had been great about it, watching over me without seeming to make a fuss, always ready to cheer me up if I seemed gloomy. So she kept doing little favors for me, like making me sa making me sandwiches or taking on parts of my cleaning rotor. Then, about a fortnight after Lenny had gone, the two of us were sitting in my attic some time after midnight, chatting over over mugs of tea. Ruth got me really laughing about Lenny. He hadn't been such a bad guy but once i started telling ruth some of the most intimate things about him it did seem like everything to do with him was was hilarious and we just kept laughing and laughing then at one point ruth was running her finger a finger up and down the cassette stacks in the little piles along my skirting board she was doing this in an absent-minded sort of way when she kept laughing but afterwards i went through a spell of suspecting it hadn't been by by chance at all and that she noticed it there maybe days before, perhaps even examined it to be sure, and then waited for the best time to find it. Years later, I gently hinted this to Ruth, and she didn't seem to know what I was talking about, so maybe I was wrong. 
anyway, there we were, laughing and laughing each time I came out with another de another detail about poor Lenny. And then suddenly it was like plug a plug had been pulled out. There was Ruth lying on her side across my rug, peering at the spine of the cassette in the low light. And then Judy Bridgewater tape was in her hands. After that, after what seemed like an eternity, she said. So how long have you had this again? I told her, as neutrally as I could, about how Tommy and I had come across it that day when she had gone with the, the others. She was on examining it and then said, So Tommy found it for you? No, I found it. I found it. I saw it first. Neither of you told me, she shrugged. At least, if you did, I never heard. The Norfolk thing was, tr was true, I said. You know, about it being the last corner of England. It did flash through my mind Ruth would pretend not to remember this reference, but she nodded thoughtfully. I should have remembered at the time, she said. I might have found my red scarf then. We both laughed and the uneasiness seemed to pass, but there was something about the way Ruth put back the tape without discussing it any further that made me think it, was, it wasn't finished with it with, with yet. I don't know if the way conversation went I don't know if the way com the conversation went after that was something controlled by Ruth in the light of her discovery or if we were headed that way anyway and that it was only after Ruth realized she could do with it with with it what she did we went back to discussing Lenny in particular a lot of stuff about how he had sex and we were ha laughing away again at the point I think I was just relieved she finally found the tape and not made a huge scene about it. And so maybe I wasn't being as careful as I might have been. Because before long, we had drifted from laughing about Lenny to laughing about Tommy. At first, it had felt good. It had felt good-natured enough, like we were just being affectionate towards him. But then, we were laughing about his animals. As I say, I never been sure whether or not Ruth deliberately moved things around, around to this. To be fair, I can't even say for certain she was the one who first mentioned the animals. And once we started, I was laughing just as much as she was about how one of them looked like it was wearing underpants, about how another had to be been inspired by a squash hedgehog. I suppose I should have said in there somewhat that the animals were good that he had done really well to have got where he had with them, but I didn't. That was partly because of the tape. And maybe if I have to be honest, because I was pleased by the, by the notion that Ruth wasn't ta taking the animal seriously and everything that implied, that implied. I think when we eventually broke up for the night, we felt as close as we had ever done. She touched my cheeks on her way out, saying, It's really good. The way you always keep your spirits up, Kathy. So I wasn't prepared at all for what happened at the churchyard several days later. Ruth had discovered that a summer Ruth had discovered that summer a lovely old church about half a mile from the cottages, which had behind it rambling grounds with very old gravestones leaning in the grass. Everything was overgrown. Leaning in it. Everything was overgrown, but it was really peaceful, and Ruth had taken to doing a lot of her reading there, near the back railings, on a bench under a big willow. I had not at first been too keen on this development, remembering how the previous summer we had all sat around together in the grass right outside the cottages. All the same, if I was headed that way on one of my walks, and I knew Ruth was likely to be there. I would find myself going through the low wooden gate and along the overgrown past the gravestones. Overgrown path past the gravestones. On the afternoon, it was warm and still, and I had come down to the path in a dreamy mood, reading off the names on the on the stones. When I saw not only Ruth but Tommy was on the bench under the willow, Ruth was actually sitting on the bench while Tommy was standing in what with one foot up on its rusty armrest and doing a kind of stretching exercises as they talked. It didn't look like they were having any big discussion and I didn't hesitate to go up to them. Maybe I should have picked up some something in the way they greeted me, but I'm sure there wasn't anything obvious. 
I had some gossip I was dying to tell them something about one of the newcomers and so for a while it was just me blabbing on while they nodded and asked the odd question. It was some time before it occurred to me something wasn't right and even then when I paused and asked did I interrupt something here? It was in a jokey sort of way. Sort of way. But then Ruth said Tommy has been telling me about his big theory. He says that he has told you ages ago but now very kindly he's allowing me to share it to share in it too Tommy gave a sigh and was about to say something but Ruth said in a, in a mock whisper Tommy's big gallery theory then they were both looking at me like I was now in charge of everything and that it was up to me what happened next it's not a bad theory I said it might be right I don't know what do you think Ruth I had to really dig it out of sweet boy here. Not very keen at all on letting me on it. Were you, sweetie gums? It was only when I kept pressing him to tell me what was all behind this art. I'm not doing it just for that, Tommy said sulkily. His foot was still up in the armrest and he kept on with his stretching. As I said was, if it was right about the gallery, then I could always try and put in the animals. Tommy, sweetie. Don't make a fool of, of yourself in front of our friend. Do it to me. That's alright. But not in front of our dear Kathy. I don't see why it's such a joke, Tommy said. It's as good a, a theory as anyone else's. It's not the theory people will find funny, sweetie guns. They might, might well buy the theory right enough, but the idea that you will, be, you will swing it to me... Mm. Oh my god. But the idea that you will swing it by showing madame your little animals. Ruth smiled and shook her head. R Tommy said nothing and continued with his stretching. I wanted to come to his defense but was trying to think of just the right thing that would make him feel better without making Ruth even more angry. But that was when Ruth said what she did. It felt ba bad enough at the time. But I, I had no idea in the churchyard that day how far-fetching the repercussions would be. What she said was, It's not just me, sweetie. Kathy here finds your animals a complete hoot. My first instinct was to deny it, then just to laugh. But there was a real authority about the way Ruth had spoken, and the three of us knew each other well enough to know there, was, there had to be something behind her words. So in the end, I stayed silent. While my mind searched back frantically and with cold horror settled on the night up in my room with our mugs of tea. Then Ruth said, As long as people think you are doing those little creatures as a kind of joke, fine. But don't give out that you are serious about it, please. Tommy had stopped his stretching and looked questioningly at me. Suddenly, he was really childlike again, with no front whatsoever, and I could see too something dark and troubling gathering behind his eyes. Look, Tommy, you've got to understand, Ruth went on. If Kathy and I had a good laugh about you, it doesn't really matter, because that's just us. But please, let's not bring everyone else on it. I've thought about those moments over and over. I should have found something to say. I could have just denied it. Though Tommy probably wouldn't have believed me, and to try to explain the thing truthfully would have been too complicated. But I could have done something. I could have challenged Ruth, told her that she was twisting things and that even if I might have laughed, it wasn't in the way she was implying. I could have gone up to Tommy and hugged him right in front of Ruth. That something that have came to me years later and probably wasn't a real option at the time given the person I was and the way the three of us were, were with each other. But that might have done it, where words would have only got us in deeper. But I didn't say or do anything. It was partly, I suppose, that I was so floored by the fact that Ruth would come out with such a trick. I remember a huge tiredness coming over me, a kind of lethargy in the face of the tangled mess before me. It was like being given a math problem when your brain's exhausted and you know there's some far off solution but you can't work up the energy even to give it a go. Something in me just gave up. A voice went, alright, 
Let him think the absolute worst. Let him think. Let him think it. And I suppose I look at him with resignation, with a face that says, "Yes, it's true. What else did you expect?" And I can recall now, as fresh as anything, Tommy's own face, the anger receding for the moment, being replaced by an expression almost of wonder, like I was a rare butterfly he had come across on a fence post. It wasn't that I thought I would burst into tears or lose my temper or anything like that, but I decided to just turn and go. Even later that day, I realized this was a mistake. All I can say is that, at the time, what I feared more than anything was that one or the other of them would stalk off first, and I would be left with the remaining one. I don't know why, but it didn't seem an option for more than one of us to storm off. And I wanted to make sure that the, that the one was me, so I turned and marched back the way I had come, past the gravestones, towards the low wooden gate. And for several minutes, I felt as though I had triumphed. That now they had been left in such in each other's company, they were suffering a fate they thoroughly deserved. And that was chapter sixteen, and we're gonna end today's reading. At chapter seventeen, which is the end of part two, one sip of the last of my coffee and tea. Chapter seventeen. We are ending today's stream with chapter seventeen of part two. Never let me go by Kazuo Ishiguro. As I've said, it wasn't long until. <laughs> as I've said, it wasn't until a long time afterwards, long after I had left the cottages, that I realized just how significant our little encounter at the churchyard had been. I was upset at the time, yes, but I didn't believe it had to be. I didn't believe it to be anything so different from the other tiffs that we had. It never occurred to me that our lives, until then so closely interwoven, could unravel and separate over a thing like that. But the fact was, I suppose there were powerful tides tugging us apart by then, and it only needed something like that to finish the task. If we understood that back then, who knows? Maybe we would have. We would have kept a tighter hold of one another. For one thing, more and more students were going off to be carers. Among our old Hailsham crowd, there was a growing feeling that this was the this was the natural course to follow. We still had our essays to finish, but it was well known that we didn't really have to finish them if we chose to start our training. In our early days at the cottages, the idea of not finishing our essays would have been unthinkable. But the more distant Hilsham Hilsham grew, the less important the essays seemed. I I had this idea at the time that I was probably right that if our sense of the essays was being being important was allowed to seep away, then so too would whatever bound us together as Hilsham students. That's why I tried for a while to keep going our enthusiasm for all the reading and note taking, but with no reason to suppose we had ever. We would ever see our guardians again, and with so many students moving on, it soon began to feel like a lost cause. Anyway, in the in the days after that talk in the churchyard, I did what I could to put it behind us. I behaved towards both Tommy and Ruth as though nothing special had occurred, and they did much the same. But there was always something there now, and it wasn't just between me and them. Though they still made a show of being a couple, and they still did the punching on the arm thing when they parted, I knew them well enough to see that they had grown quite distant from each other. Of course, I felt bad about it all, especially about Tommy's animals. But it wasn't as simple anymore as going to him and saying sorry and explaining how things really were. A few years earlier, maybe six months earlier, it might have worked that work out that way. Tommy and I would have talked it over and sorted it out, but somehow, by the second summer, things were different. Maybe it was because of this relationship with Lenny. I don't know. Anyway, 
talking to Tommy wasn't so easy wasn't so easy anymore. On the surface, at least, it was much like before, but we never mentioned the animals or what had happened at the churchyard. So that was what had been happening just before I had the conversation with Ruth in the old bus shelter when I got so annoyed with her with, for pretending to forget about the rhubarb patch at Hailsham. Like I said, I had probably not have got so got nearly so cross if it hadn't come up in the middle of such a serious conversation. Okay, we have got through a lot of meat of it by then, but even so, even if we were just easing off and chatting by that point, there was still all part of our trying to sort things with each other, and there was no room for any pretend stuff like that. What had happened was this. Although something had come between me and Tommy, it hadn't quite got like that with Ruth, or at least that's what I had thought, and decided that it was time I talked with her about what had happened in the churchyard. We had just had one of those summer days of rain and thunderstorms, and we had been cooped up indoors despite the humidity, so when it appeared to be clear for the, for the evening, with a nice pink sunset, I suggested to Ruth we get a bit of fresh air. There was a steep footpath I had discovered leading up to the, leading up along the edge of the valley, and just where it came out onto the onto the road was an old bus shelter. The bus had stopped coming ages ago. The bus stop sign had been taken away, and the wall of the back of the shelter there was, there was left only the frame, that. Of what must have been, must have once been, glass in notice display, displaying all the bus time. But the shelter itself, which was a lovingly constructed wooden hut with one side open to the fields going down the valley side, was still standing, and even had its bench intact. So that's where Ruth and I were sitting together to get our breath back, looking at the cobwebs up on the rafters, and the e and the summer evening outside. Then I said something, you know, Ruth, we should try and sort it out. What happened the other day? I made my voice conciliatory, and Ruth responded. She said immediately how daft it was, the three of us having a rose over the most stupid things she brought up other times we rode and we laughed about it, a bit about them. But I didn't really want Ruth to just bury the thing like that, so I said, still in the least challenging voice I could, Ruth, you know. I think sometimes when you are in a couple, you don't see things as clearly as maybe someone can can from outside. Just sometimes, she nodded. That's probably right. I don't want to interfere, but sometimes just lately, I think Tommy's been quite upset, you know, about certain things you have said or done. I was worried Ruth would get angry, but she nodded and sighed. I think you're right, she said in the end. I've been thinking about it a lot too. Then maybe I shouldn't have brought it up. I, sh I should have known you. S you had seen. You. S you would see what was happening. It's not my business, really. But it is, Kathy. You're really one of us, S and so it's always your business. You're right. It hasn't been good. I know what you mean. The stuff the other day about his animals. That wasn't good. I told him I was sorry about that. I'm glad you talked it over. I didn't know you if you had. Ruth had been picking at some molding flakes of wood on the bench beside her, and for a moment she seemed completely absorbed in this task. Then she said, Look, Kathy, it's good we are talking about Tommy. I've been wanting to tell you something, but I've never quite known how to say it, or when really. Kathy, promise you won't be too cross with me. I looked at her and said, Well, as long as, as it's not about those t shirts again. No, seriously. Promise, you won't get too cross, because I've got to tell you this. I wouldn't forgive myself if I kept quiet much longer. Okay, what is it, Kathy? I've been thinking of this for some time. You're no fool, and you can see that maybe me and Tommy, we might not be a couple forever. It's that's no tragedy. We were right for each other once. Whether we will always be. That's, an, uh, that's anyone's guess. And now there's all this talk about couples getting deferrals if they can prove, you know, that they are really right. Okay, look, 
What I want to say, Kathy, is this. It would be completely natural if you thought about, you know, what would happen if me and Tommy decided we shouldn't be together anymore. We are not about to split, don't get me wrong. But I think it was completely normal if you at least, at least wondered about it. Well, Kathy, what you have to realize is that Tommy doesn't see you like that. He really, really likes you. He thinks you are really great. But I know he doesn't see you like, you know, a proper girlfriend. Besides, Ruth paused and then sighed. Besides, you know how Tommy is. He can be fussy. I stared at her. What do you mean? You must know what I mean. Tommy doesn't like girls who have been with, you know, with this person and that. It's just a thing he has. I'm sorry, Kathy. But it wouldn't be right not to have told you. I thought about it and then said, It's always good to know these things. I felt Ruth touch my arm. I knew you would take it right the right way. What you've got to understand though is that he thinks the world of you. He really does. I wanted to change the subject but for the moment my mind was blank. I suppose Ruth must have picked up on this and because he, she stretched out her arm. She stretched out her arms and did a kind of yawn and saying, If I ever learned to drive a car, I would take all of us to a trip to some wild place. That more, say, the three of us, maybe Laura and Hannah too. I would love to see all the box and stuff. We spent the next several minutes talking about what we'd do on a trip like that if we ever went on one. I asked where we would stay and Ruth would say we could borrow a big tent. I pointed out that the roof, the wind would get really fierce in places like that and our tent could easily blow away at night. None of this was that serious. But it was around here I remember at the time back at Hailsham when we were still be, we had still been juniors and we were having a great picnic by the pond with Miss Geraldine. James B had been sent to the main house to fetch the cake we had, hauled, we had all baked earlier, but as he was carrying it back, a strong gust of wind had, <clears throat> had taken off the top layer of the sponge, tossing it into the rhubarb leaves. Ruth said she could only vaguely remember the incident, and I said, trying to clinch it for her memory. The thing was, he got into trouble because that proof he had been coming down through the rhubarb patch. And that was when Ruth looked at me and said, Why? What's wrong with that? It was just the way she said it, suddenly so false, even an onlooker, if, there's, if there had been one, would have seen through it. I sighed with irritation and said, Ruth, don't give me that. There's no way you've forgotten. You know what Ruth was out of bounds. Maybe it was a bit sharp, the way I said it. Anyway, Ruth didn't back down. She continued pretending to remember nothing, and I got all the more irritated, and that was when she said, What does it matter anyway? What's the rhubarb patch got to do with anything? Just get on with what you were saying. After that, I think we went back to talking in more or less friendly way, and then before long, we were making our way down the, football, the footpath in the half-light back to the cottages. But the atmosphere was never quite righted itself and when we said our good nights in front of the back black barn we parted without our usual touches on our arms and shoulders it wasn't long after that, that i had made my decision and once i had made it i never wavered i just got up one morning and told kefers that i wanted to start my training to become a kikara it was surprisingly easy he was walking across the yard his wellingtons covered in mud grumbling to himself and holding a piece of pip pipe piping I went up to him and told him Sorry And he just looked at me like I had bothered him about more firewood Then he grumbled something about coming to see him later that afternoon to go through the farms It was that easy It took a little while after that of course but The whole thing had been set in motion And I was suddenly looking at everything The cottages, everybody there in a different light. I was now one of those, one of the ones leaving, and soon enough, everyone knew it. Maybe Ruth thought we would be spending hours talking about my future, 
Maybe she had thought that she would have a big influence on whether or not I changed my mind. But I kept a certain distance from her, just as I did from Tommy. We didn't really talk properly again at the cottages, and before I knew it, I was saying my goodbyes. And that is the end of today's reading session uh, of chapter 17, part 2. Part 2, chapter 17, never let me go. We are done, guys. There's part 3 coming up, but that's not gonna... That's not coming up until... I think I'm gonna do it on Monday, probably Monday. What do you guys think about the story so far? Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate all of you. Thank you, Chizuru. Thank you for the follow. Thank you so much. Thank you, nine one. For joining the stream. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Ando. Thank you to Alusha for the follow. Thank you so much, guys. One day we're getting closer to closer and closer to 180, and after that we are going to be hitting 190. I hope I did okay today. I stumbled a lot. I'm really sorry about that. Um. Okay. That's the end for today's reading session. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I really do not want to promise what time I'm gonna stream anymore because I'm, I'm terrible at it. But um, uh, but. Yeah, thank you so much for being here, you guys. Um, until the next reading session, which I'm not going to promise. <laughs> uh, probably on Monday, okay? Probably on Monday, Monday 11.30 a.m. Or 12 a.m. or 12 p.m. or noon. Yeah, it depends, okay? Um, we'll finish up the book. Chapter, uh, part 3 chapter 18 okay uh until then i'll see you guys uh in game I'm doing random stuff i'm probably gonna do my msq and everything and i'll stream tomorrow or something tomorrow or sunday i'll see how it goes uh and 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 what month what i'm gonna say yeah um, I'll see you guys soon uh, for the next reading session. Um, but I'll be streaming MSQ on the weekend. Um, drop by if you see me. Ha ha ha. On stream. Um, until then, take care. Uh, stay healthy. Stay awesome. And uh, I'll see you all on the next reading session. I'll send you all off right now. <laughs> Have you ever had a dream that 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 you 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 can do you can do do you can you want to do you can Thank you for listening, guys. I love y'all. I love y'all so much. I I'm really really grateful and thankful for each and every one of you who are in my stream right now, and also in game. Come in to game and hang out with me for a few hours. <laughs> I promise I'll do a better reading <laughs> soon. I hope you guys are enjoying the story as much as, much as I do. And um, whether you are guys want you guys want to spoil yourself with the ending or anything like that, um, I will encourage you guys to go watch the movie after uh, my reading session finish. 
or if you want to know the ending before I finish reading it, yeah, go watch it. Never let me go. Uh, 2010. It's a 2010 movie. 13 years ago. Woo. Yeah, that's crazy. I'm old as hell. Uh, okay. Thank you so much. I love y'all. I'll see you guys soon. Bye bye. Bye bye.